When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. May our testimonies be as deep and as strong as that of Jacob, who, when confronted by one who sought to destroy his faith, declared, I could not be shaken. Welcome back in Shaken Saints. I'm Jared Halverson, always thrilled to spend time with you in the scriptures. And today we're going to be picking up where we left off last week with the second half of our double header, if you're a baseball fan, or the second installment of our double feature, if you prefer the movies. Last week, we spent our time with the prophet Elijah, and it's hard to beat him. But if there were ever a sequel that was equal to the original, it's the ministry of Elisha that follows. These two prophets go hand in hand Oh, in so many ways. We're the, if you didn't fall in love with Elijah last week, then shame on me for not teaching it better. Uh, the experiences that he had with the widow of Zarephath up on top of Mount Carmel with the contest with the priests of Baal, or there on Sinai with a still small voice in the midst of this fire and wind and earthquake. So many incredible stories. No wonder we look back to Elijah with such fondness. And no wonder Jews to this day look forward to the coming of Elijah. And no wonder we Latter-day Saints rejoice that he's already come, restoring priesthood keys and turning hearts of children to fathers and fathers to children and bringing back the sealing power. So much of Elijah's ministry is still blessing the world today. Uh, so how do you follow that, right? Uh, big shoes to fill? You better believe it. Well. Elisha has incredibly big feet. And to be able to spend time with him today, I hope will be an absolute joy because there are so many echoed experiences. Uh, just like we saw God repeating things from Moses' ministry in Joshua's to reassure him, you got this. We're going to see similar echoes today uh, in the ministry of, of Elisha. Uh, but also we're going to see the two of them as their ministries interweave with various kings of Israel and Judah. Uh, because the church and state never really get separated, okay? Uh, nor should they. There is there's something that these prophets need to say to the kings to try to whip them back into shape. Now, last week, we saw wicked kings up north in Israel. Remember Jeroboam, Rehoboam, they split, and there's problems in both kingdoms, but Israel's in the north, Judah is in the south. By the time Elijah comes on the scene, you have King Ahab in the north, Ahab and Jezebel, the absolute worst. I mean, there's power couples, and then there's like their opposite. Uh, and if there were ever a couple that was aimed at destruction, their own and their people's, it was Ahab and Jezebel. We saw Ahab die last week, and his son Ahaziah is now going to reign in his place. Meanwhile, King Jehoshaphat is still reigning down south in Judah. And he was awesome. If you didn't get to finish last week's lesson, uh, the last few chapters, from, especially from 2 Chronicles version, Jehoshaphat's my absolute favorite forgotten king of Judah. Uh, and I, I don't want to forget him. Uh, and so that's why I taught him. Uh, and so I hope that you'll spend some time with him last week. But there he is reigning in the south. You have Ahaziah reigning in the north. And you have Elijah beginning to pass the baton to his successor, Elisha. So time of change, okay? Politically, religiously, you name it. And that's where we get to 2 Kings, where we start. In chapter 1, notice how this story begins. Then Moab rebelled against Israel after the death of Ahab. Still wars practically on every side. Uh, Ahab had, been want, had always wanted to expand his kingdom uh, by any means possible. I mean, down to having Naboth killed so he can take over his <laughs> adjoining vineyard. Well, he's taking adjoining kingdoms as well. And as long as Ahab was in charge, then he kept the Moabites under the Israelite thumb uh, and they were paying tribute. But they didn't want to keep doing that. And now that there's a new person on the throne, maybe he's weaker than his father. He was. Uh, and maybe there's some, some pushback that we can give. And so they rebel. Meanwhile, keep going. Ahaziah, this is... Well, Ahab's son, his successor, he fell down through a lattice in his upper chamber that was in Samaria and was sick. And he sent messengers and said unto them, Go, inquire of Baalzebub, the god of Ekron, whether I shall recover of this disease. 
Now, Baal Zebub, you hear Baal in that, but Baal Zebub sounds a lot like Baal Zebub, and sure enough, that's where we get the name. Wait, you're going to go to the devil rather than God to get some advice? Well, I guess that's my only option since I've kind of alienated the God of Israel through my actions. And sadly, that's what ends up happening to us too. Why don't we turn to God for guidance? Is it because we're afraid that he'll take advantage of the opportunity to cry some repentance along with it? Oh, I'd love to be able to tell you what to do from here. I've been trying to tell you what to do all along and you haven't been listening very well. Can we work on that together? God is merciful, but he's also just, and it's the justice that Ahaziah is afraid of. So let's go somewhere else. Now, verse 3, the angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite, so he's still with us, Arise, go up to meet the messengers of the king of Samaria, and say unto them, Is it not because there is not a God in Israel that ye go to inquire of Baalzebub, the god of Ekron? I mean, this is like Saul going to the witch of Endor. Uh, no prophets in Israel, Saul? Well, none that I want to face. Uh, and so I'm going to go to a, a different source here. Well, it's a lower one. And why don't you instead just rise to a, lot, a higher level of living? Because there is a God in Israel. Why do you keep acting like there isn't one? And that's, what the, that's the main message of 2 Kings chapter 1. If there are true messengers, two true prophets of a true God, then act like it. Because unfortunately, you're acting like there is no God in Israel. No wonder you're going somewhere else to get guidance. And no wonder you're living such a, a wicked life as if there were no God of righteousness that's going to call you out on it. Well, if there's one thing Elijah was always good at, it was calling people out, right? And so here he's going to call out Ahaziah. He says to his messengers in verse 4, Now therefore thus saith the Lord, so take this message back to your wicked king, Thou shalt not come down from that bed on which thou art gone up, but shalt surely die. That's it. Mic drop. And Elijah departed. Now that's not what uh, Ahaziah is going to want to hear, right? Maybe that's why he went to the god of Ekron instead. My god's probably going to have a bad message for me since I'm a bad king. But if I go somewhere else with lower standards, maybe he'll cut me some slack. Uh, this is a lot like, well, like father, like son. Remember Ahab when he's like, hey, uh, let's go off to fight. And Jehoshaphat, same king, is saying to him, let's ask God about this first. And he's like, uh, okay, can I use my own prophets? And remember uh, the, all the yes men that came and said, oh, yeah, that's exact. this is what you want to hear? Then that's the case. And uh, Jehoshaphat has to call Micaiah and say, uh, could you give us the real word of the Lord? That's basically what's happening here. And Elijah is the new Micaiah and kind of a smock, smack talker like, like uh, Micaiah was also. And here's the word. It's, you're not going to survive this. You will die. Well, the messengers go back. It's fun. It's funny. They don't even go on to Ekron. It's like, why get the false message when we actually have the true? And it'll save some time too. So they go back to the palace in Samaria and they tell Ahaziah the message that they got. Yeah, there was some other guy that met us along the way, some prophet of the Lord, and he told us that you're, you're a goner. You're going to die. Sorry, but, but that's the word. Now, they didn't even catch the messenger's name. So they don't even realize that this was Elijah. But Ahaziah, who probably knows the stories of Elijah from his dad, is starting to wonder, oh, great, it's probably him. He always shows up when you don't want him to. And so he asks his messengers in verse 7, What manner of man was he which came up to meet you and told you these words? And they answered him, He was a hairy man and girt with a girdle of leather about his loins. So I, he didn't leave his name, but he, was, he left an impression, that's for sure. Some hairy guy in leather. And the king says, oh, It is Elijah the Tishbite. Oh, great. It's interesting to think that that's all the description that was required. Hairy guy with some leather. Well, here's a guy that lives out in the wilderness, probably, who certainly doesn't care what people think of him uh, to, to dress like that. It actually is the Old Testament equivalent of the New Testament John the Baptist. John the Baptist that was described as going around in the wilderness, kind of a wild man out there, crying repentance, not caring what people thought, speaking truth to power, calling out the wicked of his day, and going about with camel hair and leather. Hmm. 
Well, maybe he wasn't hairy enough on his own. So to look the part, he needed to dress up and wear some camel hair to be able to appear like a new Elijah, the Tishbite. Actually, when Jesus talked about John the Baptist, and he could have been saying the same things about Elijah, his predecessor, he said to those that went out in, for curiosity sake, rather than covenant's sake, why did you go out into the wilderness? Why did you go down to Jordan to see this wild man out crying repentance and baptizing in Jordan? He said, what went ye out into the wilderness to see? Was it to see a reed shaken in the wind? I love that description because that was not John the Baptist at all. It's not Elijah at all. You ever seen a cattail, a reed, something that's top heavy, but has this slender stem. But when the wind blows, it catches the top and the bottom has no, no, has no say in the matter. It just has to bend whatever direction the wind happens to be blowing. Well, reeds, yes, are shaken in the wind. But John the Baptist wasn't. Elijah certainly wasn't. They didn't care about the prevailing winds of popular opinion. I don't care what Ahab says. I don't care what Ahaziah says. I don't care what the wicked people of Israel are saying. How long halt ye between two opinions? Oh, I'm standing up against the false one. So come be an obstinate reed with me and lean into the wind and push back against it. That's what he was hoping for. That's what John the Baptist was. That's what Elijah was. And then Jesus says a second thing. If it wasn't a reed shaken in the wind, was it, were you expecting to see someone in, in king's clothing, in dainty attire, uh, someone that cared what people thought and was trying to be as oh, soft on themselves as possible, or someone guilty of priestcraft that was just trying to enrich themselves and say what people wanted to hear? Because that's not John the Baptist either. Nor was it Elijah the Tishbite. Camel hair and leather, folks not princely raiment. And to see someone of this caliber, someone of this courage, no wonder John the Baptist would go, talk, go face to face with Herod and pay it for it with his life. No wonder Elijah would climb Mount Carmel and take on 850 false prophets. Oh, there's courage here. And I see the same kind of courage in prophets and apostles God has called in our day. Well, notice what happens here. Verse 9, the, the plot thickens. Ahab no, it's not Ahab, Ahaziah knows, oh great, this is the family's arch nemesis. And he's told me I'm going to die. I wonder if there's any way I can convince him to convince his God otherwise. So in verse 9, he sends 50 men, a little mini army. It says, the king sent unto him a captain of 50 with his 50. And he went up to him, up to Elijah. Behold, he sat on the top of a hill. And geographically, this is perfect. Of course, Elijah is going to be on higher ground than the, than the wicked king's troops. Well, they come to him and said, thou man of God. Hmm, well, that's an honorific title. Okay, we realize who you are. You holy man, you man of God. The king hath said, come down. Now, that's literal, since Elijah is sitting on top of this hill. But symbolically, even better. Isn't that what the wicked always say to the righteous? Come down. Come down to our level. But quit t telling us to come up to yours. No, let's settle into a path of least resistance. Let's go with the flow, which is always downhill. And wouldn't, you, wouldn't it be easier on all of us if you would just come down to us and quit crying repentance? It only makes people feel bad. And so come down and tell the king what he wants to hear. Why do you think he sent us to Ekron? <laughs> that God will say anything. Well, come down to us. And that's not what this prophet Elijah is willing to do. He's no reed shaken in the wind, after all. So verse 10, Elijah answers and says to the captain of 50, If I be a man of God. Now pause right there. Is he questioning his own identity? Oh, I, I don't know. Am I? Am I not? If I'm a man of God, then maybe, no, this is Elijah we're talking. And he's talking smack, just like he did up on Mount Carmel with Ahaziah's father. We're about to see another version of we got fire, yes we do, we got fire, how about you? What is about to unfold is going to be an echo, an aftershock, if we want to talk earthquake language, of what took place with the priests of Baal. 
when fire came down from heaven and consumed the sacrifice, and then Elijah went on and consumed the wicked priests and destroyed them all. Here he's not wondering, am I a prophet of God? He's taking this man's, the captain's words and throwing them back in his face. Because how did the captain refer to him? How did he address him initially? Thou man of God. And here Elijah, probably with a smile, says, oh, it, do you really think I am one? Do you, you said, you, you're talking the talk. Why aren't you walking the walk? If you address me as a man of God, then why don't you act on the words from God that I'm giving you? So here's the rest of his words. If I be a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy fifty. And sure enough, there came down fire from heaven and consumed him and his fifty. I, I warned you this was a repetition of the contest on Carmel. And a similar thing happened. I think God and Elijah are teaching Ahaziah, son of Ahab, the same lesson they tried to teach his father. Why did, if you th say I'm a, a man of God, then why aren't you acting like it? Why aren't you accepting my invitations to repent? Why aren't you reforming religion like I'm trying to help you do? Because it's a life and death proposition. It was for your father. It was for his priests of Baal and Asherah. Pretty soon it, is, it will be for you. And even now it has become that for the people that you sent to accost me, to arrest me, to drag me down to your level and try to get me to say what you want me to say. That's not man of God. So which am I, Ahaziah? Which am I? Are you willing to bank your life on this? Because accepting or rejecting prophets, which means accepting or rejecting God, whether by my own voice or the voice of my servants, it is the same. That is, spiritually speaking, a life and death proposition. So let's make it a physical life and death proposition to make it all the more obvious. That's exactly what's happening here, and it is powerful. This lightning bolt, this pillar of fire, that's what God is. And Elijah has God on his side. Well, I don't know how Ahaziah back in the palace catches word. I don't know if he just sees the smoke ascending from the distance or some onlooker runs back and gives the, the, the scary tale. But undeterred, Ahaziah sends another captain of 50 with another 50. Ah, when are you going to learn? Well, the same exact thing takes place. Hey, man of God, come down. In fact, this time he's even more insistent. You wasted time on the first one. So this time he says, come down quickly. Well, that was gutsy. And again, Elijah responds, well, if I am, then why aren't you acting like it? And let's let God be the decider of all of this. And sure enough, fire from heaven and another 50 are gone. Well, still undeterred, King Ahaziah sends a third round of 50. But if you were the captain of the third 50, how would you feel? This hasn't really gone well, King Ahaziah. You sure you want to try again? Ah, he doesn't care about his people. He doesn't care about his men. He only cares about himself. And I don't want to die from this fall off the lattice. Uh, and so I've got to convince Elijah to side with me. Well, this third captain of 50 goes, probably quaking in his boots. And in verse 13, the third captain of 50 went up and came and fell on his knees before Elijah and besought him, he's begging here, and says to him, O man of God, and I mean it this time, I pray thee, let my life and the life of, thy, of these fifty thy servants be precious in thy sight. If you compare the way the third captain of fifty speaks to Elijah compared to the second and the first, it's so much more humble. Oh, it's not making demands. It's humbly asking for mercy. He beseeches him. He, I pray thee, I'm in no position to call the shots and command you to come with me. The only position I'm in is practically the horizontal one, bowing before you, begging for my life. Would you please come and speak to my master? I know he's not your master, but will you come and speak? And this time, 
an angel intervenes, comes to Elijah and reassures him, it's safe to go. I got your back. I know you've always had mine. So Elijah returns with this third captain of 50 and his 50. And he repeats to King Ahaziah the same message as before. You haven't changed. So why would God change his message to you? Life and death for these hundred before you, life and death for you. And I'm sorry, it's death. And he died. Verse 17, he died according to the word of the Lord, which Elijah had spoken. Since he was speaking for God, he really was a man of God and everybody knew it. And then it's on to the next king. Jehoram reigned in his stead in the second year of Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, because he had no son. And this is, I'll, admittedly is really tricky. Wait, Jehoram reigned during the second year of Jehoram? Yeah, sorry. Don't worry, there's no quiz at the end of the lesson. <laughs> you don't have to regurgitate the names of the kings of Israel or Judah. You just need to learn from their lessons, good and bad, how to live better lives yourselves. Hopefully, we've learned this lesson from Ahaziah, as he now is shuttled off the stage and replaced by someone else. Now, speaking of replacements, or in this case, successors, since no one can truly replace Elijah. Chapter 2 of 2 Kings is where we see Elisha live into, step into, grow into the shoes of Elijah. And it's a fascinating story. I love 2 Kings chapter 2. In verse 1, it came to pass, when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind, that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. Now, talk about a nonchalant way of talking about a prophet's passing. Oh, well, you know, when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven. Wait, 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 what did you just say? Uh, yeah, it's the end of his ministry, and it's going to be the beginning of Elisha's ministry, so it's time to turn the page and move forward. Whoa, um, does it mean that little to you? Oh, no, no, it means all the world to me, God would say. But the work is what goes on. And whether it's Elijah today or Elisha tomorrow, I'm still behind all of this. I'm still <laughs> building my kingdom and, and working with my children. And so, yes, it's time, it's time to change. I mean, speaking of nonchalance and speaking of understatement, think about when a bishop is relieved, released after five years of service or a state president released after like nine or ten. And what do we do? All who can join me in expressing our, our vote of thanks for this incredible decade of self-sacrifice, please show by the uplifted hand. That's it? Uh, we don't even give them a standing ovation? Just know, okay, thank you for your service. And now, moving on. I'm not trying to say this to diminish the service of a, of a servant of God at all, but rather to show that it's God behind them that is continuing the work all throughout. And so it's time, Elijah's time has come to an end. Elisha's time has come to its beginning. And that's okay. Being released from a calling is not the end of the world. It's not the end of your service. Even being released from this life is simply a transfer uh, in the mission field to a new field of labor, labor on the other side. We'll see that, and nobody personifies that better than Elijah, right? Talk about continuing his labor on the other side. Well, in verse 2, Elijah says to Elisha, Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Bethel. And Elisha said unto him, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Bethel. They went together. I mean, you don't get any stronger language than that, right? As the Lord liveth, that's the ultimate oath language. I swear on the existence of God, and if that's not enough, I swear on your existence, Elijah, I'm not leaving. This is as loyal a friend and follower as you could ask for. This is, in some ways, Ruth and Naomi all over again. I'll lodge where you lodge. I'll die where you die. I'll be buried where you're buried. Well, that's where it ends because Elijah doesn't get buried. <laughs> okay? uh, but what happens here, I just want to go with you. So where are we headed next? Uh, going to Bethel, ooh, right into the lion's mouth. I mean, that's the center of Israelite idolatry. That's where Jeroboam set up his golden calf. Okay, let, let's do it. I don't care if you're heading straight into the lion's den, I'm, I'm following you. Uh, I don't care where a prophet leads, I will be with him. 
And if he leads me into a place where my reputation may be on the line, so be it. And Elisha goes. Now in verse 3, once they arrive, the sons of the prophets that were at Bethel, so you have, remember these one-hit wonders, these prophets that pop up and, and make a ministry or, or do something quickly. Um, there seem to be followers, disciples of Jehovah, uh, scattered throughout Israel and Judah. And you have some that are there at Bethel. They come forth to Elisha and they said to him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he said, Yea, I know it. Hold ye your peace. And this is an interesting exchange because it's like these, these sons of the prophets are saying, Hey, um, this is your last day with, the, with Elijah. You know that, right? Uh, his ministry is coming to an end and I hope you got what you needed because it's, it's over. And Elisha's beautiful response, yes, I know. Would you shut up, though? Sorry for the language. Uh, would you just hold your peace about this? Quit rubbing it in. Now, I don't think they're rubbing it in, but Elisha kind of takes it like this of, I know that this, this phase of my life, this chapter is coming to its close, and I have to turn the page today, I know. But I'm not to the, last, I'm not to the period at the end of the sentence yet. And I want to milk this moment for all that it's worth. I think sometimes, and it's probably because we're human beings and we're emotional, that we allow tomorrow's emotion to seep into today and ruin it. Because if we know that tomorrow's emotion is going to be a sad one, a negative one, a difficult one, then we, well, we might as well start feeling it already. And, and that's tragic because we end up losing the last moments that could have been good when we let sorrow from tomorrow become pain today. Now, I know this is easier said than done, but it doesn't have to be that way. Can we, can we somehow confine the difficulty of the moment to the moment of the difficulty? I actually learned this from an investigator on my mission as a greenie. We were teaching a younger, a younger guy, kind of college age, uh, the gospel, and he loved it. Loved the Book of Mormon, loved the church, and, but also loved the girl that he was living with outside of marriage. Okay? So we knew that when we got to the fifth discussion and had to talk about the law of chastity, this was not going to go over very well. At least that was our fear. Because, well, best case scenario, hey, we, we could have a marriage before the baptism. We do that. Uh, or worst case scenario he's going to drop us because he doesn't want to drop his girlfriend. Well, oh ye of little faith, we taught him the law of chastity. We did it cautiously and compassionately, but we did it clearly and tried to explain this is, this is serious to God. Is it serious to you? And what amazed me was how he took it. He knew what it meant. And we, we said, take all the time you need, but talk it over with your girlfriend and whatever, we're here for you, whatever happens. And, and when he spoke with us, he let us know, my girlfriend doesn't have any interest in joining the church. I do. And my girlfriend doesn't have any interest in getting married, whether or not I do. So we're going to break up and she's going to move out. Because I know the gospel is true and I want to get baptized. I know the law of chastity comes from a loving Father in heaven. And I, I know it's a path to happiness. There's something inside me that always felt there was something wrong with this cohabitation and fornication. And I just want to do what's right. So, this guy was amazing. And I remember that he said, and we were like heartbroken for him because we knew his heart was breaking too. But what was amazing, we were just like, are you okay with all of this? And he said, yeah, yeah, I know it's the right thing to do. And we're like, but aren't you devastated? And, and he said, I know I will be, but I don't want that to ruin where I am right now. And so somehow, amazingly, at the, that emotional control to be able to say, I'm going to push back the sorrow until the moment that we actually break up and she moves out. And then I know my heart will break and there's nothing I can do about it. But I'm going to postpone the sorrow until the moment of sorrow actually arrives. Now, I'm not saying that we're robotic and, or Vulcan and we can, can, to can totally control that emotion. But I am saying, don't let 
tomorrow ruined today. And I do love the, the hint I get from Elisha along those lines. Yes, I know that my time with Elijah is ending, but please hold your peace because I still have time. And there's a few last lessons that I really want to gain before this is over. Now, the same series of events happens. Uh, that happened in, Beth in Bethel. Then they go down to Jericho. We're getting closer and closer to the line of demarcation, which is the Jordan River. Okay? So now they're at Jericho, as close to Jordan as you can get. And the same thing happens. A bunch of sons of the prophets come out and go, hey, you know, this is the last day, right? Yeah, I do. Quiet about it. I still have a few more minutes. And I want to milk them for all they're worth. And then they go to Jordan. Now, what's with all of this travel? I actually wonder, was Elijah trying to prepare Elisha using these last moments, not just to spend with him, but to go throughout, kind of make the rounds <laughs> so that Elisha gets exposure to these sons of the prophets? So they start to see, hey, you know it's my last day. Guess who's with me? Because guess who I'm leaving behind to be with you? Okay, this is a senior companion preparing a junior companion because I'm about to get transferred and you need to know the area. And so Elisha is getting this kind of exposure. It happened in Bethel, happened in, in Jericho, and then it happens again in Jordan. They finally reach the Jordan River in verse 8. And this time, Elijah takes his mantle, his coat or cloak. He wraps it together, folds it up, and smote the waters. Kind of slapped the Jordan River with his folded up coat. And they were divided hither and thither, so that they too went over on dry ground now, is this ringing bells? It should. And it should have rung bells for the sons of the prophets that were there at the Jordan River watching this. Wait, what just happened? This is a repeat of Joshua at the Jordan River, which was an echo of Moses at the Red Sea. What's happening here? Are we seeing these echoed experiences as God's way of showing who the next prophet will be? If Joshua was Moses 2.0, is Elijah 3.0 or Elisha 4.0? Are we watching the succession take place? By the way, when Joshua crossed the Jordan River on dry ground, it was so that the entire house of Israel could cross. This time, no less a miracle. But just for Elijah and Elisha? It's like, uh, Elijah, party of two, uh, the water will part for you now. And they cross, and then the river starts to flow again. It's amazing that, I think too often we think that God only pulls out miracles for the multitudes. Well, he does do that, but he also allows waters to part just for you. And there's something about, God doesn't worry about needing to get all the bang for the buck. Oh, just two today? Well, where two or three are gathered in my uh, name, there shall I be in the midst of them. And he wanted to be in the midst of these. He was. Now, they're on the other side of the Jordan. What happens next? Verse 9, it came to pass, when they were gone over, that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. Any parting wishes? Any last requests? Or maybe what he's really saying, is there anything more I can do for you? Because this will be my last chance. And Elisha's response is fascinating. He says, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. Now, when I was younger, I used to, I read this and thought, wait, is Elisha trying to be like, I don't know, outdo his predecessor? Like, a, you know, the son who wants to outdo his dad, right? Uh, or just, I'm going to be better than, than the person before me. So I want a double portion. I want to be twice the leader, twice the prophet that you were, Elijah. Now, as we get to know Elisha more in the next few chapters, you'll realize how badly I misjudged him when I thought that might be what he was saying. Because if anything, Elisha is so much more understated than Elijah was. Elijah was an in-your-face prophet, right, up on the Mount, Mount Carmel. Uh, Elisha is much more willing to be behind the scenes. In fact, over and over, we'll see him sending servants so he can stay out of the spotlight. I'm not cut from the same bold, coarse cloth that Elijah was cut from. I'm, I'm different. I'm more soft-spoken. I'm, 
I'm calmer. I don't make fun of people like Elijah does sometimes. Uh, I've never accused a false god of spending too much time in the bathroom. Okay? Uh, but, oh, and actually, let me say right there, I love the fact that God has, they're so similar, so many experiences, so many miracles. Their names are practically the same. And yet Elisha is just different personality and will come at things from a different, a different angle than Elijah did. And that's a good thing. You don't have to be your predecessor. Even if your predecessor was amazing and you're like, I'm never going to be able to fill their shoes. P please uh, help me. Well, that's actually what Elisha is praying for. To see if you've ever had to follow someone who was amazing. Someone that you literally followed, and, and rightfully so. Like, I just want to be like this person when I grow up. And then, uh-oh, uh you mean I have to follow them, like, literally, like, succession? There's no way I can be the next bishop after that bishop. Uh, there's no, I mean, again, we saw this poor Joshua. And there will never be another prophet like unto Moses. And take it away. Yikes. Poor Peter filling Jesus' shoes. Poor Brigham filling Joseph's. Poor you. As you're called into the, a calling to take the place of someone that did it incredibly well. Well, are you praying? Oh, let me be twice the person that they were. Well, then you'll be less than half. Because that's pride motivating. Whereas, what is Elisha really asking? I need a double portion of thy spirit. Thy spirit, not in terms of the spirit of Elijah. Rather, the spirit that God placed upon Elijah. It was never about Elijah, and it's certainly not me about me, Elisha. It was about God all the way through. But look what God did with you. He took that coarse cloth and, and sewed it into a mantle of prophetic power that, that rocked the world, that reformed religion, that brought Israel back into connection with their, the Lord their God. I don't think I'm half the man that Elijah was, which means I'll need twice the spirit of God that you placed upon him. That to me is a humble prayer of succession rather than a prideful petition to be better than someone that went before. I love Elisha for this. You made Elijah who he was. Will you make me who I need to be? And I'll probably need twice the amount of help that he did. Well, Elijah's response, I mean, how do you respond? What do you say to that? Uh, verse 10, he said, thou hast asked a hard thing. Hard because it's not something I can do. It's not me giving you me. It's God giving you him. So nevertheless, he goes on, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. I think that was Elijah's way of just leaving it in God's hands. I can't give you God's spirit. I certainly can't give you my personality, and I wouldn't want to. You're different, and that's good for a reason. Uh, the Lord needs to shift back and forth between different leadership styles. It's a difference of administration like we see in the, pro in the prophetic gifts, right? The gifts of the spirit. But I'm just going to leave it in God's hands. If you see me caught up to heaven then that's God's way of saying, yes, I'll give you that double portion. If you don't, then I guess that's God's way of saying, sorry, it's not going to happen. Now, is it just that sign, though, or is he saying something? Is he setting something up? It's like, if you see me caught up to heaven, then what do you see? You see the heaven I'm caught up into. It's not about you looking at me and wanting to be like me. It's looking past me at the source of my strength, because that'll be your source, too. So as you watch me caught up to heaven and watch me enter in, it's almost like the veil will part just enough that you get to see the real source of strength. And seeing that should be all the reassurance that you need, that heaven is there. The heaven that took me in is the heaven that will send out to you all the strength and spirit that you require. And sure enough, that's exactly what happens. In verse 11, it came to pass as they still went on and talked. I love that the conversation still goes. Again, any more minutes, any more seconds? I just want to take advantage of every opportunity to... I'm hanging on your every word, which is wise for us to do as far as prophets in our midst. 
have they said anything? Is there anything in the church newsroom? Has he given a fireside anywhere? What's the latest place that they've been and taught? And I just want to learn and soak up every bit of spiritual strength the prophet has to offer. They went on, they talked, and behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder. That was the only thing that could split them apart, right? This chariot of fire. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Oh, Moses 2.0 indeed. Here he is, translated, Elijah, just as Moses had been. Why? Because they both had more missions to perform. They would yet be companions uh, on the Mount of Transfiguration in passing down priesthood keys to Peter, James, and John. They would yet be companions again in the Kirtland Temple, once again passing down priesthood keys to Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery. Oh, there was a purpose that his mission didn't come to the kind of close that we're used to because he still had more work yet to perform. And in the midst of that, as, as Elisha did indeed see it take place, verse 12, Elisha saw it and he cried, my father, my father. Is he referring to Elijah as father? It's a good title. Do we see them as our spiritual fathers, our closest, most loving mentors? Or is he looking beyond him, seeing the real father that's on the other side? Either way, he goes on, the chariot of Israel, the horsemen thereof, he saw it all. And then he saw him no more. And Elisha took hold of his own clothes and rent them in two pieces. And then he took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him. Now we're going to see in a moment what he does with that mantle, but pause here and think about what's just happened for Elisha. He tore his own clothing and then takes up the mantle that had fallen down from heaven when Elijah was caught up. Now, what does it mean to rend one's clothing? Well, we've seen it before in scripture and it's the ultimate symbol of mourning. And again, you get a sense from Elisha how devastated he is at Elijah's passing on or passing up. This, I'm devastated that he's gone. I will miss him. I'm glad this is finally the moment where he can really let get go into this. Remember before it was like, I know it's today, but it's not yet, so hold your peace. Well, now there's no more reason to hold this peace. And so there is time to mourn. And I'm sad to to lose all that I've had these last, however long it was, learning at the feet of Elijah. So mourning is definitely happening here, but I think there's something else here too. Because to tear his own clothing and then take up the mantle, to me, is a beautiful symbol of laying aside his pre-prophetic clothing to make room for the mantle of, the, of a prophet of God. I mean, we talk about the mantle experience with Joseph Smith to Brigham Young, right? And even to, to this day, anytime a prophet passes away and a new president of the church is ordained uh, or set apart, the... We speak of the mantle passing. And that's a powerful experience to be able to sense that. And authority has gone from one to another. But it's God's authority and it's the same thing there. So to, to recognize, this is where it all begins, that the mantle has passed and it's now upon Elisha. But I love the fact that he, re, he tears his own clothing first. In a way, this is a repeat of what happened at the end of 1 Kings last week when Elijah first comes and throws his mantle upon Elisha, uh, dropping a subtle hint like, hey, does this, does this fit on your shoulders like it's fit on mine? I, I hope so, because it should. It will someday. And Elisha takes the hint and follows him. But what's he doing following him? He'd been plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and he takes the plow and destroys it to make a fire, and then takes one of the yoke of oxen and offers them upon that altar. Literally, what has he just done? He's made a sacrifice of his previous life. He's made an offering of his earlier identity. I'm not going to need this plow anymore. I'm going to go plow up <laughs> hard-crusted hearts and try to plant seeds of faith within them. I don't need this for that. Oh, oxen? No, this is sacrifice and giving them up to God. He's doing it again. My clothing... That's not who I am anymore. 
clothes make the man, well, that's not the man I am anymore, so get rid of that clothing and put on this clothing. In a way, that is Russell M. Nelson laying aside his surgery scrubs. That is Dallin H. Oaks laying aside his judicial robes. That is Henry B. Eyring laying aside his professorial cap and gown. And all the prophets and apostles who have laid aside their previous lifestyles and professions and, and everything else to, to give it all up for God, I'm amazed that they're willing to do that. Actually, let me say one thing. I'm blown away by this. I wish I had a video of it because I've only heard it on the audio version. And I don't know if there's a video version that's available. If there is and you've seen it, please let me know. It's, it happened in a, in a commencement address that President James E. Faust gave at BYU-Idaho years ago. Might have still been Rick's College then. I don't know. But in it, he was talking about, he must have been, I'm guessing he was wearing the cap and gown at a commencement that everyone seems to wear, right? What Hugh Nibley called the, the robes of the apostate priesthood, <laughs> okay? Well, at some point, and I only listened to this, but President Faust, in his meek, gentle, kind way, said, I now lay aside the, the robes of academia, something along those lines. I, I lay aside this cap and gown to take back up the comfortable cloak of the holy apostleship. I, I think that's the way he phrased it. And I wonder if he did it literally. I wonder if he actually took off his cap and laid it aside or unzipped the gown and took it off to reemerge in his normal white shirt and tie as a true messenger of the true God. And, and I just loved the symbolism of what he said there. This is the comfortable cloak. This is the mantle of the holy apostleship. And that's the clothing God has asked me to wear. It wouldn't fit if I was still holding on to my previous profession. And so I laid it aside. And now the mantle fits beautifully. Elisha is doing that. And I've seen for a lifetime, prophets and apostles willing to do likewise. It is self-sacrifice and it's beautiful. Now back to verse 13, when Elisha takes up this mantle, he then stood by the bank of the Jordan and he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him. And I can picture him like, I really hope this works. I'm going to need twice as much help, double portion, please. And he smote the waters just like Elijah had. And then he said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he also had smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither, and Elisha went over. It worked, much to Elisha's relief. Actually, I doubt it was relief. I think it was total faith. I think he knew what had just happened. He'd sensed and felt the mantle. And when he asks the question, he didn't say, where is Elijah? He knew where he had went. He'd seen it the whole way. And by seeing it and seeing that veil part and seeing the real source of strength, he knew the answer to his question. Not about Elijah, about Elijah's Lord. Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And by reenacting the miracle that had just happened a few moments before, there's an audience, right? And these sons of the prophets now realize they have a new prophet to follow. And it's Elisha. Because the Lord God of Elijah is now the Lord God of Elisha. And what's the common, the common refrain? The Lord God. He's the one that's been carrying through all of this. And we will see echoes of Elijah's experiences in the ministry of Elisha from this moment forward. It's amazing. Well, they, they see this, this audience, these sons of the prophets. And in verse 15, when the sons of the prophets, which were to view at Jericho, saw him, they said, the spirit of Elijah doth rest on Elisha. We've seen it. And they came to meet him and bowed themselves to the ground before him. We are witnesses of this mantle experience. And pray for that whenever a prophet passes in our day. Pray that you might behold and feel the spirit of one that has passed to the other. It's the spirit that we're after. In verse 16, however, there's something they still don't quite get. They said unto him, Behold now, there be with thy servants fifty strong men. 
Now, we hope that this is a different <laughs> scenario with 50 than what we saw in chapter 1. Sure enough, <laughs> they say, Let them go, we pray thee, and seek thy master. Lest, peradventure, the Spirit of the Lord hath taken him up and cast him upon some mountain or into some valley. And he said, Ye shall not send. Now, strange scene here. You have these sons of the prophets that loved Elijah and are st getting to know Elisha, but they're wondering, well, I don't, I mean, who knows what happens with chariots of fire? Uh, <laughs> maybe God was just taking him up, but not all the way up. Maybe he was taking him to some mountaintop somewhere, just kind of whisking him, whisking him away to some valley where his ministry is continuing. Uh, can we send 50 on a search and rescue mission to make sure that Elijah's, I mean, if he's out there, we want to make sure that we can bring him back. Now, I don't blame them. They didn't get to see the heavens open quite like Elisha did. But Elisha did see it and knew that, no, it's done. That's why he gave them the advice. It's just, can you be okay with the change? The transition has taken place. So don't go and send. It would be a wild goose chase because he's not with us anymore. I'm here. Let's move forward. And that's actually really good advice for us also. That when a prophet passes, move forward and recognize the spirit that's upon his successor. Because we have a hard time with that. We have, as human beings, we have a difficult time with change. We have a hard time with transition. And when you loved your old bishop, and I don't know about this new one, or that old stake president, well, I've spent a decade with him, and I don't know this... It really happens with prophets, which is why, as I've said in the past, that we always seem to be one dispensation behind the curve. That people in Moses' day were like, you're no Abraham. And then people in Jesus' day, you're no Moses. And people in Joseph Smith's day, you're no Jesus. And he wasn't, and, but, but he was the Lord's prophet. And why are we always one dispensation behind? Because time has vindicated the prophet, but it took time to do it. It, like we saw last week, you have to catch up to the watchtower before you see what the watchman on the tower saw before you. And so there's the risk of accepting a prophet in the day of that prophet. It's easier to accept yesterday's prophets because now it's, <laughs> the risk is over. They've been proven right. Well, a similar thing happens within our final dispensation with prophet after prophet. People that accepted and knew Joseph was a true prophet of God. Some left the church as soon as the church went with Brigham. Like, no, I'm, I'm, I'm a Joseph guy. I've actually met people that call uh, us Brighamites and call themselves Josephites. In a way, that's the history of the RLDS church. We're only, we only follow Joseph to that point, and then we're sticking with him, but not Brigham Young. Uh, you could see the same thing happen when Wilford Woodruff became president of the church. No, no, I believed in Joseph Smith and Brigham Young and John Taylor. But I cannot accept Wilfred Woodruff. At least I can't accept the manifesto that ended plural marriage. And that's where the FLDS church comes from. Uh, they're still holding on to previous versions and will not allow God to pass the mantle to a successor. Did that happen for some after Spencer W. Kimball died? And wondered, oh, I, I know too much about uh, Ezra Taft Benson's politics to accept him as a prophet of God. Did you not see the mantle pass? And Ezra Tapp Benson became a new man when he was, became president of the church. It's amazing. Did some people's discipleship die at the death of Gordon B. Hinckley? Because President Monson was different. Or did it die after President Monson? Because President Nelson was different. Will some people stop following prophets when President Nelson dies? Because as if President Oaks outlives President Nelson, then he will be the next president of the church, senior apostle. And will that be too much for some? And no, I'm going to go back and search. Maybe he's on a mountain somewhere. Maybe he's off in a valley somewhere. But there's surely I only want to live in the past prophet's ministry. No wonder it takes someone to say, move forward. Ye shall not send. There, don't worry, there will be enough echoed experiences for it to feel familiar. And that's one of the reasons I think that they got to see the, the water part. And we'll get to see all kinds of repeated miracles today. But also, in addition to enough familiarity, there will be enough uniqueness to help you know that this man was called to lead you through this day. A man for his season. 
Well, verse 17 and 18, they won't take no for an answer. Uh, so they urge him. And, and when they urged him till he was ashamed, you ever had a child just pester and bug you until it's really awkward and like even embarrassing? They're making a scene like, I said no. I know, but I won't take no for an answer. Well, that's kind of what they're doing. And so he finally says, okay, send. Ah, they sent therefore 50 men and they sought three days, but found him not. And when they came again to him, for he tarried at Jericho, he said unto them, did I not say unto you, go not? This isn't a neener, neener, I told you so, but simply, uh, are you ready to move forward? I, I saw where he went. Can you not trust me on that? Are you ready to move forward? And they finally are. Elisha is ready to move forward. Is Israel ready to move forward? All of this is symbolized by the crossing of the Jordan, which is the Israelite equivalent of ancient Rome's crossing the Rubicon. Remember when Caesar did that? It's like, I'm crossing a line and there's no going back. And we see them crossing the Jordan. That's the line that separates promised land from wicked world or wider world. That's when Joshua brought them in. We're leaving our wilderness wanderings behind. Will we conquer Canaan? Will we live up to the promises of the promised land? And in a similar way, Elijah crosses the Jordan. And that's the end of my ministry. And I'm going on to the other side, literally. Meanwhile, Elisha crosses back. Another crossing of the Rubicon, crossing the line. I'm leaving behind my previous life and beginning my ministry as a prophet of God. There's, there's power in making these kinds of, well, crossing these kinds of lines deciding I will not go back to what I used to be. Now the shift from Elijah to Elisha was a miracle, as we just saw. And Elisha's ministry just began with a, minute, with a miracle, crossing the Jordan on dry ground, and it's going to continue with miracle after miracle after miracle. Now we're going to see two more in this, in the rest of this chapter. And one is a blessing and the other is a curse, because some people will accept Elisha, and others will reject him. And our response to prophets really is our choice, but it will lead to blessings or curses. Okay? And in some, in really, that's the way Doctrine and Covenant section 1 begins this dispensation. That God's sword, sword of the word, sword of the spirit, is bathed in heaven. He's beginning to speak again, but it will come down and cut off those who will not hearken to the word of the Lord. Separate them from those who will. And that's what we see at the end of chapter 2, as Elisha's ministry begins to unfold. First is the good story, okay? Positive, miracle, blessing for those who accept him. You see it in verse 19, the men of the city said unto Elisha, Behold, I pray thee, the situation of this city is pleasant, as my Lord seeth, but the water is not, and the ground barren. Wait, what? I thought you just said it was, we were in a pleasant situation, and why isn't there any water, and why are you in the middle of a drought? Well, I'm not saying that our situation is really pleasant right now. He's, he's talking about geography. We are situated in a pleasant place. That's what he means by our situation is pleasant. We're here near, near the Jordan River. Uh, the well-watered plain, as it was described back in Lot's day. That's why he picked it at Abraham's expense. Uh, like the Garden of Eden almost. That's why Sodom and Gomorrah kind of let the wealth and prosperity go to their heads. Well, it's not exactly a watered garden anymore, which makes sense since Elijah sealed the heavens and there was all this drought. In some ways, it's like you were in the perfect spot for the good days, but that does kind of set you up for <laughs> some real wrestling or some complaint or some suffering during the hard times. But I hope you know the difference. Between, Elder Maxwell said this, between general darkness and mere passing cloud cover, you're in a great situation. Life is good. You're poised for, or for continual happiness. Well, not continual. There will be an occasion, occasional passing cloud. In this case, a lack of clouds. Sorry, there was been no rain. And so you're suffering. I get that. So how are we going to do this so that you can get back into the, better, the good situation that you're used to? In verse 20, this is what Elisha says. Bring me a new cruise, some little vessel, some new container, and put salt therein. So they brought it to him. And he went forth unto the spring of the waters, at least where, where it used to be, uh, where water used to come forth. 
He cast the salt in there and said, Thus saith the Lord, I have healed these waters. There shall not be from thence any more death or barren land. And sure enough, the waters were healed unto this day, according to the saying of Elisha, which he spake. Now, interesting miracle. Let's go to the water source, at least where the living water is supposed to be coming forth. And it isn't? Huh. Pretty good symbol of apostasy. And how are we going to change that? Well, let's take some salt. Now, I can picture these people going, oh, I don't know how you feel about salt. Around here, we have a love-hate relationship with it. Because the Jordan River is wonderful, but it flows into the Dead Sea, and it's dead because of salt. The Jordan brings down the silt and so on, but then since the Dead Sea doesn't pass it on and bless anyone else, the goodness evaporates and all that it leaves is the salt behind, and that's why nothing will live there. So I, we have too much salt. And you picture Elisha saying, well, maybe of that kind, but not enough of this kind, because salt is also a symbol of covenant. That's why it was offered with the animal sacrifices in the Old Testament. That salt is a preservative. It keeps things from their natural decay. No wonder Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, one, you're the light of the world. That's easy. Shine in darkness. But two, you're the salt of the earth. Add some flavor, will you? Add some preservation. And the preservation comes through covenant. That's why, again, salt is such a great symbol of the covenant. So let's go to what is supposed to be the source of living water that has unfortunately grown dry during this time of apostasy, and let's reinfuse it with the salt of the earth. Let's reinfuse it with the covenant, and then watch living water flow forth again. Ezekiel is actually going to have a vision of this where it's not just the spring, it's the temple. That is the spring of living water. It's the temple, and he sees water flow out of the temple and heal the Dead Sea. It brings life even to that place of death. And in a, in a miniature way, Elisha is acting out the vision that Ezekiel will see. Let's go to the water source and infuse it with the salt of the earth and then watch life come forth. And that's exactly what happens. This was among people that saw in him a true prophet that could help them, and he did. Well, flip it around, and now let's see its opposite. In verse 23, this is a, a hard story, so buckle up. He went from thence unto Bethel. Let's go back into the lion's den. Back to the, I mean, I went to the source of water here. Now let's go to the source of dead water. Let's go to the source of Israelite idolatry, where Jeroboam first set up his golden calf, and see what we can do there. He goes to Bethel, and as, has, as he was going up by the way, there came forth little children out of the city, and mocked him, and said unto him, Go up, thou bald head, go up, thou bald head. And he turned back and looked on them, and cursed them in the name of the Lord. And there came forth two she-bears out of the wood, and tear forty and two children of them. Yikes. Now, in my years of studying anti-religious rhetoric, and seeing uh, skeptics throughout the Enlightenment period attacking the Bible, they loved this story because they knew everyone hated this story. It made Elisha seem so spiteful. It made God seem really, really harsh and mean. And so skeptics would bring up this story and go, oh, is that really the God you want to worship? Are those really the prophets you want to follow? bunch of innocent little children happen to see somebody with a receding hairline and they just kind of laugh among themselves and go, look at that guy, he's walking up the hill, he's bald. Maybe they'd never seen that. Okay? Maybe they had parents, fathers that weren't follically challenged. And to, to get them back as vengeance, 42 little children are mauled by two bears? Uh, if that's your God, fine. That's not mine. I'd rather go with the God of science, which is ironic since science <laughs> shows a natural world that is red in tooth and claw, as has been said, right? Survival of the fittest. Well, who's going to stand up against some, some she-bears? Anyway, I want to soften our understanding of this story, if I can. First of all, it's going to help to know a little bit of the Hebrew here that little children doesn't mean infants or small children. It's better translated adolescents, youth, teenagers. That these are rebellious youth 
uh, beyond the age of accountability. They should know better. I mean, on the one hand, it's just common courtesy or respect or hospitality that was required of everyone in the Middle East, at the, in the ancient, Near, uh, ancient Near East. But also this idea of mocking him about his baldness. Now, I imagine that most paintings or depictions of Elisha will show him with no hair because of this verse. I actually don't know what his hairline, where his hairline was or what his hairstyle looked like. Because this may all be symbolic in terms of what they're saying. Here's a, here has this for a possibility. What does hair represent symbolically? We learned this back in uh, the stories of the, of the Nazarites, that a Nazarite was not allowed to cut his hair. So the hair symbolized someone who was set apart to God. Someone who'd made covenants and oaths and promises, and I'm, I'm going to live a godly way. And my hair shows that. That's where Samson comes from. And so even with Samson, not just spiritual strength was supposed to show, but in his case, physical strength too. And so hair becomes a symbol of power and authority. Fast forward to the story of Absalom. And what was his most famous physical feature? His hair. The hair that got caught in the branches of the oak tree. His pride that got hung up on something and cost him his life. You see, in the Old Testament, hair becomes a great symbol of, of all of that. Power and authority and prestige, might. In some ways, it's the human equivalent of the horns of an animal. And to see this hair, even Elijah, how was he described? He, the, tell me what it was like with this message. He, oh, he was hairy. Again, is that literal? Probably in his case, but also symbolic. Oh, he had a lot of power. He had authority. Man. Picture a bunch of rebellious young people who don't want to be told what to do. This is anti-institutionalism and anti-authoritarianism like we see in our day, especially among the rising generation. And so on the one hand, is it a bunch of little kids going, Haha, he doesn't have any hair. Or is this rebellious people saying to him, you have no authority over me. Where's your quote unquote hair? You have no power. You have no right to tell me how to live my life. And so go up, thou bald head is like, get away from us. You who thinks that you're on a higher level. You go up. Yeah, go up to your God, baldy. Because you have no authority to tell us that we're living in a, at a lesser level. We do not recognize your authority at all. Now, another detail. Notice that it is not Elijah. Excuse me, Elisha. Elisha doesn't have like two trained animals to go on the attack whenever somebody questions his authority. No. Elisha simply curses them in the name of the Lord. That's all it says. Uh, this is, in some ways, a softer equivalent than what Elijah had done just a chapter before when it was, oh, if I really am a man of God, if you're questioning my hair length and whether I have authority or not, then let God send fire from heaven. And that's what he does. Elisha is much less confrontational as far as a specific curse is concerned. I'm going to leave my authority in God's hands and he can do with you as he chooses. He will bless the faithful. He will curse the wicked, as he always has. I was set before you life and death. Choose life. Well, you're obviously choosing something different, and I'll let God decide how he wants to deal with it. And how does he do it? With two bears. Now, the thing we know about them is that they were she-bears. Oh, in our day, we would call them mama bears. And do you remember the, the, the use of the phrase? What do we call it when somebody goes full mama bear on you? This is someone that will do anything to protect its cubs. And do you see God going mama bear to protect his fledgling prophet? Elisha is just beginning his ministry. He's heading to Bethel to go into the lion's den, or in this case, the bear cage, and to see people attacking him for that and denying his authority. God does vindicate the prophets. He did it on Carmel. Now he's doing it in Bethel. And to understand that God will protect, he will preserve, he will inspire, he will back up his prophets every step of the way. 
I do, I do hope that softens our view of what's happening here. Okay? Push back against some of the 18th century skeptics, at least. Now, chapter 3, we then see the, the ministry of Elisha really unfold. He's gone now from Bethel to Samaria, out of the frying pan into the fire, really, because Samaria is the capital of Israel. And just like Elijah focused his efforts on the northern kingdom, southern kingdom at least has some good kings now and then. Northern kingdom seems to be an unbroken chain of the worst of the worst, and it's going downhill. So Elisha goes up there. Uh, by now, Ahab's son Jehoram is ruling in Israel. Uh, this is, we have met Ahaziah before, but he's gone already. And so Jehoram's in charge. Jehoshaphat is still ruling down in Judah. That's good news. Uh, Jehoram is more righteous than his father, which isn't saying much since Ahab was the worst of the worst. But in Jehoram's defense, he does destroy the image of Baal that his parents had set up. That's good. But he doesn't remove the golden calf in Dan, uh, so the original idolatry of Jeroboam is still in place. That's the bad news. Now, Moab has been paying tribute to Israel during Ahab's reign. Uh, this is similar to what we saw back in chapter 1. But here in chapter 3, you see Moab uh, rebel against Jehoram. And Jehoram asks King Jehoshaphat to team up with him so he can go out and put the Moabites back in their place. Okay? And Jehoshaphat agrees to do it. Now, I love Jehoshaphat. Remember we talked about him last, last week. But I think here is where you see his strength become a weakness. They are inherently connected after all. And his strength was always trusting God and trusting his prophets. The weakness was sometimes he was a little too trusting of his enemies as well. But if he's trying to make some kind of connection, and I'm righteous and he's wicked, and if we can just associate, then maybe I can change him for the better. And we're going to see a lot of intermarrying between the two kingdoms. And I think some of that was in hopes of, of lifting Israel. Unfortunately, it ended up usually tearing, bringing down Judah. But here, Jehoshaphat is willing to at least go along. Now, Israel and Judah then go out against Moab, and they even pick up the Edomites along the way. Okay, it's like, hey, where are we headed? We're going to go destroy Moabites. Oh, well, we don't like Moabites either. Can we come? And so now you have a coalition of three kingdoms to go out against them. The problem is, as they head east into the wilderness to take on the Moabites, they, they run out of water. Again, the famine in the land, the drought from Elijah's day, we still have some, some aftermath of that. And so they start to worry, are we going to die even before the battle begins? Are we going to die of thirst out here? Now, King Jehoram, the one from Israel, says this is probably the God of Israel's way of destroying us all. But Jehoshaphat is like, actually, the God of Israel has been really kind to me, probably because I've been kind to him. And so let's get a better opinion over this. So verse 11, Jehoshaphat says, Is there not here a prophet of the Lord that we may inquire of the Lord by him? This is the same Jehoshaphat that had said that to his fa the Jehoram's father Ahab. And Micaiah comes, right? This is the same Jehoshaphat who listened to this prophet say, or this Levite, this priest say, stand still and see the salvation of God. God's got this. He can do miraculous things to the point we don't even have to fight. So no wonder Jehoshaphat is coming up with this idea. Let's find out what God has to say about this first. Well, one of Jehoram's servants suggests Elisha. His reputation is beginning to precede him. And evidently it's preceded him all the way to Jehoshaphat as well, because Jehoshaphat says in verse 12, oh, great idea, the word of the Lord is with him. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom went down to him. Notice they're not forcing him to come in their direction. We'll come to you, okay? Uh, Ahaziah had already made that mistake, and so we're, we're not going to do that. We recognize your authority. You don't have to do our bidding, uh, but we'd like to know what, you, what the Lord feels about all of this. So in verse 13, Elisha says to them, says to the king of Israel at least, What have I to do with thee? Get thee to the prophets of thy father and to the prophets of thy mother. Oh yeah, Elijah destroyed most of them, didn't he? It's probably hard to, to find more prophets of Baal and Asherah. Ahab and Jezebel would be so sad, so disappointed. Well, the king of Israel then says in response, Nay, for the Lord hath called these three kings together to deliver them into the hands of Moab. So that's, that's the problem. It's not, we're not in the hands of the gods of, of, or the prophets of my people. We're in the hands of the God of Israel, and thus we come to the prophet of Israel for some help. 
I do love that Elisha is pushing back to start, though. Maybe he's still got some Elijah spirit in him. Uh, why come to me now when you didn't want to come to the gods or prophet, the God of Israel or the prophets of Israel before? This is always the problem. You are choosing yes men. You're choosing, you have itching ears. You want false prophets to scratch. And no, go, go to them. Get, get, get your ears scratched by somebody else because I'm not here to tell you what you want to hear. I'm, telling, I'm, I'm here to speak the word of God. Well, that's when Jehoshaphat kind of comes in. It's like, well, yeah, but, but I'm here too. And, and I do believe in you and in our God and we do need your help. That's what happens in verse 14. Elisha says, As the Lord of hosts liveth before whom I stand, surely were it not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I would not look toward thee, nor see thee. The only reason I even came was because of Jehoshaphat. Not because of you, Jehoram. He deserves God's help because he lives a godly life. You don't because you don't. It actually makes me want to be more like Jehoshaphat in relationships so that other people have hope to stay connected to God because they're still connected to me and I'm trying to stay connected to God. I've sometimes advised people who have loved ones straying from the path. Well, as long as you have one hand that is holding firmly to the iron rod and as long as lovingly you use your other hand to hold on to them, they're never going to stray that far. They're a few arms lengths away from coming back to the path. And I just want to be that. I, if people feel like God would never answer my prayers, He would never bless me or help me through my trials, I would just want to be the type that I could say, He will talk to you, even if He has to do it through me. Let me be His voice. Let me be His, his ears. Let me be His hands. Let me help you. Because you're not as far away from God as you think. Jehoshaphat was the connection between the God of Israel and the King of Israel that had severed the connection that he could have had directly. Well, Elisha is willing to do this. And so verse 15, he says, Now bring me a minstrel. And it came to pass when the minstrel played that the hand of the Lord came upon him. Now this is the power of music to invite the Spirit. This is David back before King Saul and playing the harp to try to drive out the evil spirits, to, to soothe the soul. This is the book of Psalms that we'll study in a few weeks. And to, it's, I think it's worth it, like Elisha does. What kinds of things do you know will invite the Spirit into your life? Is it spiritual music? Is it nature? Is it prayer? Is it service? Is it pondering? What, whatever it is, lean into that. And Elisha does. And here comes the message inspired by the Lord. He said, Thus saith the Lord, make this valley full of ditches. Now that's some strange military strategy. It's even stranger if that happened to be like the lyrics of that minstrel's song. Uh, look up ditches in the topical guide part of the hymn book, and I don't know if it's going to be there. Okay, uh, No hymns come to my mind. But again, it wasn't about the hymn, it was about the spirit that the hymn invited. And that was the spirit's counsel. Go out and dig ditches. That might be hard because the ground is so parched, but just start digging. And then 17, the word goes on, for thus saith the Lord, ye shall not see wind, neither shall ye see rain, yet that valley shall be filled with water that ye may drink, both ye and your cattle and your beasts. And this is but a light thing in the sight of the Lord. He will deliver the Moabites also into your hand. Now, remember their first initial prayer was just for water. That, that, that we'll take care of the battle. We'll worry about the battlefield later. But we're dying of thirst here. So that's really what we're after. And so the digging of trenches, of ditches here, is, there a, is the water table higher than they realize? And so this is, well, maybe that's where, I mean, that's where the water is going to come from, from beneath, not from above, because you're not going to see any wind blowing in clouds from the Mediterranean. You're not going to see any rain coming down from above. But don't worry. Phil... You, you dig the trenches, I'll, st I'll take it from there. They will be filled with water enough that you will all have sufficient to drink. But I'm even going to bless you in a ways that you didn't ask for. I'll go above and beyond on this one because not only am I going to deliver water to you, I'm going to deliver the Moabites to you as well. And you will win this war. Well, the first part of the blessing comes by the next day. They wake up in the morning and 
Verse 20, the country was filled with water and they could all drink. Now that's from the Israelite angle. Now from the Moabite angle, they hear that the armies of Judah, Israel, and Edom are all teaming up against them. So they go out to fight and defend themselves or attack back. And as they're meeting them, they see these ditches filled with water as well. But from their side, I don't know if it's just the light of the morning sun reflecting off in a strange way, but from their, from their angle, it looks like blood. In verse 22, it says, They rose up early in the morning, and the sun shone upon the water, and the Moabites saw the water on the other side as red as blood. And they said, This is blood. The kings are surely slain. They have smitten one another. Now therefore, Moab, to the spoil! Now, do you remember when Jehoshaphat was in that battle that didn't end up being a battle? When he was told to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord? Because the armies that were coming out against him ended up turning on each other and wiping each other out. Well, that's what the Moabites are assuming happened with this coalition of Israelite, Judahite, and, and uh, Edomite uh, warriors. Yeah, those people can't get along at all. There's been civil war between at least Israel and Judah for generations. And so, yeah, they destroyed each other. And now we can take their stuff, take their spoil, take their land to the spoil. And they start running forward. Now, this isn't quite what happened with Jehoshaphat. And it's certainly not the reality because the Israelites and the Edomites and the Judahites are all alive and well. In fact, they're hunkered down well... <laughs> Uh, well rested or well, they'd, they're no longer thirsty at all. And I'm ready to fight. Uh, but these people, assuming there is no fight ahead, imagine their attitude or their level of preparation as they come rushing headlong into an enemy they don't think is there. See how God is setting this up for success? You see in verse 24, when they came to the camp of Israel, which they assumed would be empty or just a lot of dead bodies, the Israelites rose up and smote the Moabites so that they fled before them, but they went forward smiting the Moabites even in their country. So a total rout. Why? Because the Moabites had let their guard down. They thought the battle was already won. That's how God won the battle, by convincing the enemy that they had won. It's like Isaiah says, it's the, the dream, those who fight against Israel, it's like someone dreaming of eating food, but it, they only ate it in their dream. And when they woke up, they were still as hungry as ever. You thought you succeeded. You didn't. People attacking the church currently, people saying that the church is hemorrhaging members and, and it's falling apart and it's all false. Just someday the world will wake up and see what the truth has always been. And so we wait for that. And we trust God in the meantime. Uh, and on the flip side, I hope we never fall into the same trap and just assume that the victory is won even if we don't do anything to win it. The attitude that we take going into battle, this combination of faith and great anxiety, to borrow Jacob's words, uh, faith that God has it, but anxiety that we, we have some work to do ourselves, that's a good combination. And it's not the combination that the Moabites had. That's why they lost. Now, with those three chapters behind us, the next two, four and five, are probably the most famous chapters in the ministry of Elisha. And they rank right alongside the famous chapters of the ministry of Elijah. They're absolutely incredible. And they are parallel in more ways than one. Second Kings chapter 4, verse 1, Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead. And thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord. And the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. You see what's happening here? This is a widow woman who has lost all ability to provide for her family. Sound familiar? Widow of Zarephath? With Elijah coming to multiply oil and meal? Well, in this case, this is a woman that seemed to have plenty of meal and oil at some point, but no longer. Currently, she is so deeply in debt that her creditor is coming to drag off her two sons off into debtor's prison uh, or to indentured servitude until debts are paid and so on. 
Uh, this is, again, a very close equivalent. This is my last meal. We're going to eat it and die. Well, this is my last time with my sons because they're about to get dragged off. Now, I wish we knew more about this woman. She's just a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets. So, oh wait, so she was married to someone among those, those prophets that pop up here and there to cry repentance. Now, the book of Kings doesn't tell us who the husband was, but Josephus, the ancient Jewish historian, does make at least a suggestion. I don't know his sources, but maybe he's got better ones than us. He was closer to the action anyway. He said that this woman was the wife of Obadiah. Now, remember last week, Obadiah was the, the, a servant of King Ahab? But right under Ahab's nose, he's sneaking off and feeding a hundred prophets, keeping them alive in a cave. Now, if that's the case, I mean, yes, that's the case that Obadiah was doing that. But if this is the case, that this is his wife, then no wonder they're in debt. That's what Josephus suggests as well, that the reason they're so deep in debt, they, they felt the responsibility to take care of these hundred prophets, but it's in a time of famine in the land. So even if I am the king's steward and I'm to help the governor of the house and I'm sneaking things off, but I, how do I provide at least a raven's ration to a hundred people that I know are, are disciples of the true God. It's amazing to think that they went into debt to do it. I mean, we already saw last week, he's putting his life on the line to do it. Because if Ahab and Jezebel find out, then I'm dead. Uh, by now, he's, he is dead. He's gone. And this woman is all that's left. And I, I spent my whole... The whole period of the famine giving to others. And I know that the Lord says that if you lose yourself in service to others, you will find yourself. But I'm finding myself in a, in a hard, hard situation. I already lost my husband. I lost all that I possess. I'm about to lose my boys. Is there anything that you can do for me? And she cries to Elisha. Verse 2, Elisha responds, what shall I do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in the house? And she said, Thine handmaid hath not anything in the house, save a pot of oil. I mean, I don't even have a barrel of meal with one handful left. All I have is a pot of oil, and that, what am I going to do with that? It's not enough to sell to save my boys. It's not, I'm at the end of my rope. But I love that Elisha asks her those questions to start. What shall I do for thee? Jesus asked a similar question of his mother when they were out of wine at the wedding of Cana. What's your thought here? How, I, I don't want just to give out uh, miracles and blessings without having you wrestle and think and try to problem solve yourself. And so, what's your solution? I need you to be involved in the solution yourself. So what do you think? And then the other part, what do you have? Let's inventory your potential resources. This is Jesus saying to the apostles, everybody's hungry. Okay, does anybody have any food? And this one little boy, well, five loaves, two fishes. Well, that's not going to do anything. Well, but at least we have something to start with. We got some seed corn. Okay, we have something to begin. A, a miracle of multiplication. You see, multiplying anything by zero still ends up zero. So you got to have something to start. What do you have? Do you have faith? Do you have Oh, means? Do you have gifts? Do you have friends? Do you have family? Don't just show up to the bishop saying, I'm in need, and so I need some church welfare. Because a wise bishop will say things like this, okay, what do you need help with? And what do you have already? What resources can we turn to? I'm not trying to just give out welfare. I'm trying to help people become self-reliant. And so let's stay involved in this. Now, verse 3, in response to her statement, oh, I, I do have one pot of oil, but that's it. What's that going to do? He says, go borrow thee vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels. Borrow not a few. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons. Now, what's this going to do? Uh, are you trying to rub it in that I have nothing? You want me to bring in all my neighbors' nothingness as, as well? And uh, now I'm surrounded by empty pots in need of filling? Well, yeah, that's the point. They are in need of filling. And guess who the master filler is? That's why he says at the end, 
thou shalt pour out into all those vessels, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. Wait, wait, what? I, this makes no sense at all. I know, God specializes in that. Uh, it's called faith. The, what's going to happen is you have this one full uh, vessel of oil surrounded by as many empty ones as you possibly can find from all your neighbors. So I want you to involve other people. I actually want you to have the humility to ask for help. And even if all they have is empty vessels to, to offer, then that's better than nothing. Bring them. Uh, so there's some humility, there's some meekness, there's some involvement, some participation in this miracle yourself. Bring your boys in. I want them to be a part of it since this is going to save their bacon. Uh, close the door because we're not doing this miracle to be seen of man. Uh, but humbly, meekly, faithfully come and then start pouring the full into the empty. Well, then I'm just transferring. <laughs> this, that, this isn't going to do anything. Now I just have a new full pot at the expense of an, a new empty one. Just try. Just trust. And just like your <laughs> counterpart up in Zarephath found that the barrel of meal and the cruise of oil never failed, you will discover that your little pot, your vessel of oil will never fail either until it has filled every single one of the empty ones. You see, that's what she does. She pours it out and every empty pot is filled. This is Jesus multiplying those loaves and fishes all over again. There's enough left over in her, in her original one. And what does she do? Verse 7, she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go, sell the oil, pay the debt, and live thou and thy children on the rest. There will be enough and to spare. Just like the loaves and fishes. Twelve baskets. It's not often that your leftovers exceed your original meal. But that's the case when God is the one doing the multiplying. Amazing what happens. Now that's the first miracle in this chapter. And it's a miracle of multiplication, like I said. Also a miracle of filling empty things. And think about that in your own life. Oh, an empty tomb was filled with the resurrection. Now an empty life can be filled with meaning and hope. An empty heart can be filled with love and charity. There's, God is so good at filling empty things. And so if you feel empty, turn to the source of, of that fullness and it will come. It will come to the point that you'll have enough for yourself and enough for those around you. In fact, switch the order. That might be the way it comes. Even out of your emptiness, pour into theirs. I don't have enough for myself, let alone for them. Well, then reverse it. Trust the miracle and start meeting the needs of others. And you will find miraculously your needs being met along the way. There are those beautiful, beautiful principles there. But now shift to what some would consider an even greater miracle in the second half of this chapter. Verse 8. It fell on a day, which seems pretty random. It just happened. It fell on a day that Elisha passed to Shunem where was a great woman, and she constrained him to eat bread. And so it was that as oft as he passed by, he turned in thither to eat bread. Speaking of the widow of Zarephath feeding Elijah, now you have this Shunammite woman, is what, how she's referred to, feeding Elisha. And raven ration, probably much far beyond it, uh, but equally frequent. Anytime you pass by, you come in. Now notice she's a great woman. Uh, there's a lot of possible interpretations of her greatness, uh, her great heart. It could be the, the amount of wealth that she has to be able to contribute and share with uh, Elisha here. But notice the other phrases. She constrained him. She had to insist. And she did it every single time. Here is Elisha. I don't want to be a burden. Uh, God can provide for me in other ways. Well, he's doing it through me today. So sit down and come in and, and you're eating. There's something powerful about being insistent and persistent in our service. Too often we just say, hey, can I do anything for you? And when they don't say no or they don't answer, we just assume all is well and we go on. Now, sometimes we have to insist. Sometimes we have to constrain. I remember hearing that once in a talk about mental health or children with special needs 
that you don't ask if there's anything you can do because there's always something you can do. You just show up and you do it. <laughs> uh, I'm not asking, I'm insisting, I'm constraining that you take this. Sometimes it's too hard for someone to ask. No wonder Elisha had asked the previous woman, you need to ask your neighbors for some help. Well, <laughs> is it coming back to him? Now, you need to be humble enough to receive blessings at someone else's hand. And he is. And every single time, that's the, that was the insistence. As often as he passed by, that's the persistence. And this wonderful Shunammite woman has both. Then verse 9. She said unto her husband, Behold now, I perceive, so that this is a discerning woman, I perceive that this is an holy man of God, which passeth by us continually. Let us make a little chamber, I pray thee, on the wall, and let us set for him there a bed, and a table, and a stool, and a candlestick, and it shall be when he cometh to us that he shall turn in thither. Now this woman is looking for better ways to sustain the prophet. More than just the minimum, oh, I guess I'll give him some bread on the way through, that's just hospitality. Well, to be hospitable, to open our home, let's like really open our home. Let's make him a room within it. And we'll carve out some space that he can call his own. To think about this symbolically when it comes to prophets. I mean, literally, you take the Shunammite widow, literally, you, or woman, she's not a widow. That's a big difference. Literally, you can add Amulek who carves out space in his home for Alma and provides food, but he ends up living with him and blessing Amulek and his whole household the whole time that he stayed. Well, I'm sure that the same blessings were coming to this Shunammite woman and her family by carving out space, literally, to have a prophet come and dwell with them. Do we do that symbolically? Do we do it figuratively? I've got my day. Do I carve out some space Make a little chamber for them where I, well, I, uh, you obviously do. <laughs> and it's a large part of your house. I apologize. Sorry, not sorry. But it's amazing how much space in your home, in your life, in your daily affairs, you carve out for time with prophets of God. Do we do that with living prophets as well as with past ones? Do we study the words that we've been taught in general conference? Do we study ancient words in scripture? Because if we do, then we are sustaining the prophet and are in powerful ways. Are we insistent and consistent in our scripture study? And are we realizing, you know what? Prophets always seem to be around us. Oh, this Elisha guy, first of all, I perceive he's a holy man. That's our first step. Do I recognize the power that comes into my life from scripture? Do I recognize the power that comes into my life from heeding the words of living prophets and apostles? Wow, because if I do, I want them to be a part of my life more permanently. I want them to always feel welcome in my home and in my heart. So I'm going to officially carve out space. I'm going to create a habit. And from this time to this time, or on my commute, or on my run, or when I'm doing dishes, or in the garden, I'm going to be listening to, to prophetic commentary, or go, reviewing conference talks, or whatever it might be, I have space set aside for this. And, and they're always welcome to occupy it. I also love the other things that she, she added there. A bed, a table, a stool, a candlestick. You see, the blessings flow into our life when we invite prophets into them. Give them a chamber and they will turn it into sacred space. Give them a bed. And they will teach you things that will bring true rest to your soul. Give them a table, and they will lay before you the bread of life. Give them a candlestick, and they'll light the candle in it and bring light to your darkness. They'll introduce you to the light of the world. It's, I love the example of this Shunammite woman. I want to be more like her in my own way. So prophets always feel welcome with me. Now, verse 11, it fell on a day. You get a sense that this is, seems so random. That was the phrase in verse 8. Fell on a day, he passed by. Verse 11, fell on a day. You never know when a day for a miracle has come. You better be ready for it. You better have that space carved out that a prophet always knows, because it, it might be today, and it was for them. It fell on a day that he came thither, and he turned into the chamber and lay there. He said to Gehazi, his servant, and we'll see a lot of Gehazi in these chapters, 
Call this Shunammite. You see, it's interesting that Elisha is resting from his journey, but his thoughts aren't on himself. His thoughts are on others. His thoughts are on her. She's met my needs. That's allowed me to not worry about where I'm going to spend the night. But I worry about her and how she's going to spend her life. What can we do for her? That's why he said to Gehazi, call this Shunammite. I've got a question for her. And when he had called her, she stood before him. So I, you've given me so much. I want to give something to you. What could it be? Verse 13, he said unto him, so this is still Elisha talking to Gehazi, his servant. She hasn't come yet. Say now unto her, behold, thou hast been careful for us with all this care. What is to be done for thee? Wouldst thou be spoken for to the king or to the captain of the host? Now, when the conversation took place, she answers, I dwell among mine own people. Now, there's a lot to unpack in verse 13. Say unto her, now, why doesn't he just do it himself? One of the things I, I love about uh, Elisha is how much he involves other people in the miracle. And I don't know if he's trying to train up Gehazi, perhaps to take his place. I mean, Elisha got me whipped into shape, and maybe I can get Gehazi up to speed to do similar things. But Gehazi, I want you to be involved in this. So will you have this conversation with her? Now, when the conversation says, thou hast been careful with us, or for us, with all this care, that's like the same kind of language used with Martha. You have been cumbered about with much serving. You have been careful to meet our needs. You've been so worried about the physical side of things, I don't even know if you've given yourself time to ponder the spiritual. And so what can I really offer you here? What do you need? And his two suggestions were, I could talk to the king for you, or I could talk to the captain of the host for you. Because the king can provide and the captain can protect. I keep seeing these elements of the proclamation to the world and the family. This wonderful woman, do you need additional blessings? I got a king that could help. Do you need additional protection? I got a captain that can help. But her response, I dwell among mine own people. I'm good. I don't know of any enemies because I'm surrounded by friends, so I don't need the captain's help. And I'm a great woman. I'm the, one, I'm the one providing for you, so I don't need a king to provide for me. I'm good. Trust me. Verse 14, that's not enough. She was consistent and insistent. Well, Elijah or Elisha will be also. Verse 14, he said, what then is to be done for her? You see, she's already left. I don't, I don't need your help. Just go back to sleep and I'm going to go, I don't know, get some more things ready for you. He's, Elisha is speaking to Gehazi here. That's not enough. I know she said no, but again, my turn to be insistent. So what should we do? And Gehazi answers beautifully. It was a good thing that Elisha was involving him. He said, Verily she hath no child, and her husband is old. Good call, Gehazi. She was perceptive of our needs. You're, way to go to being perceptive of hers. What do you give to someone that seems to have everything? Pay closer attention to what they don't have and see if it's possible to help meet those needs, even if it requires a miracle to meet them, because that's, that's the business God is in. He wants to fulfill the deepest desires of our heart, if they're righteous, and this would be. So in verse 15, he said, call her. And when he had called her, she stood in the door, probably ready to do some more serving. And he said, about this season, according to the time of life, thou shalt embrace a son. And she said, nay, my Lord, thou man of God, do not lie unto thine handmaid. This is too good to be true. There's no way this could happen. Uh, I, you ever heard of Sarah? Uh, I, that, I'm that old. Well, yeah. Have you ever heard of Sarah? Uh, she had a son too. And I'm promising you a similar miracle. By next year, it will come. I love when God offers us things that are too good to be true and then shows us that they're true. That's because God is good. In verse 17, the woman conceived as promised. And bear a son at that season that Elisha had said unto her, according to the time of life. And when the child was grown, it fell on a day. It's the third time we've seen this phrase. All these just chance occurrences that don't happen to be mere chance. It fell on a day that he went out to his fathers, to the reapers. Not just another day in the fields. And he said unto his father, Ah, my head, my head. 
There's no explanation of any kind of accident, of any kind of sickness. No one knows what, what, why are you clutching your head? Why are you saying this? Just some random occurrence like all these other random things have been. But the father said to a lad, one of his other servant boys, carry him to his mother. And when he had taken him and brought him to his mother, he sat on her knees till noon, just resting on her lap, and then died. Now, in a matter of four or five verses, we just went from absolute euphoria on the part of this mother, or this woman that wasn't a mother, that was becoming one, then to have that miracle yanked away? Is that all it is? Is just random that you popped into my life at random and showed up another day at random and maybe a promise at random and it randomly it happened and now randomly it's been taken away? Oh, we don't really believe in coincidences, do we? We see the hand of God in both good and the hard things. Well, in this case, this was the hard one. And she's absolutely devastated. Like we saw with the widow of Zarephath, did you only preserve my life and my son's life to yank it away from me later on? Which is it to call back to mind my own sin? That's what the widow of Zarephath said to Elijah. Or is this a chance to prove that God can both <laughs> preserve life and restore life. That was the dual miracle for the widow of Zarephath. Well, we're seeing similar miracles here. I can give you something. Oh, oh yeah, only to take it away. No, only to return it with to you again with increase. To take away something so that you know that it's a gift and then restore it to you so that you keep treating it that way. I wonder and worry sometimes that what felt like a miracle when we first got it. Keep it long enough, and it feels like something we're just entitled to. And it's all good from here. No, do we still recognize the miraculous source? We need to, so that it stays with us. In this mother's case, this Shunammite, how does she feel? We've gone from a mother's concern, to a mother's care, and now to a mother's loss. Devastatingly so. In verse 21, she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God. Oh, that was sacred space for her. I'd carve this space out for holiness, and that's where I'll lay my son. The place I wanted the prophet to be is where I want my child to be. And if I can somehow get my lifeless child in contact with a living prophet, then perhaps life will pass from one to the other. Do that if you have children that that have sat on your knees and spiritually died. Do that for children and loved ones that you worry about and weep over. How can I get them in contact with sources of spiritual strength? She brought him to the prophet's own little bed and lays him there. She then shuts the door upon him and she goes out. She called unto her husband and said, Send me, I pray thee, one of the young men and one of the asses, that I may run to the man of God and come again. I don't know what to do here. I have no solution, but I am assuming God does. I have, belief, I have faith in that, and so I have to find his prophet as quickly as I can. This accident happened on a day that the prophet didn't happen to be with me, and so I have to be intentional about making sure a prophet comes to be here today. This is a day more than any day that I need him. So please, saddle the ass, send a servant, and let's go. Now, verse 23, her husband... And we don't know anything about him, but he's not the best light here. Verse 23, he says, Wherefore wilt thou go to him today? It is neither new moon nor Sabbath. She said, It shall be well. Now what he's getting at is, wait, prophets come by for festivals and holy days to perform sacrifices or rituals or to honor the, the ritual calendar. And today's not his day. No Sabbath, no new moon, so I have no idea. I mean, he just, today's probably not the best day to reach him. It's his day off. Well, do we sometimes have the false impression that God takes days off? Or that prophets are sometimes just unavailable? No, the scriptures are, we can be opened any day. Words of living prophets are a, a button click away from us. And don't ever think that, ah, there's probably a better day I could turn to the Lord. No, if today's the day you need him, then today's the day you turn to him. And she's going to turn to him. In fact, the way she says it at the end, it shall be well. If you look at it on the page in the King James Version, it shall be are all in italics. 
which means, as I've said before, they are missing from the Hebrew, but were inserted by the King James translators to just full disclosure. We had to put this in to make it make sense. Because otherwise, what would it be in our English? Well, oh, it's his day off. And she just comes and says, well. Well, that doesn't tell us a whole lot. It shall be well is, is better. Like, it's going to be okay. Okay, I'm, I'll find him and he'll, trust me, he'll work today even if it's his day off. <laughs> he'll come to the rescue. Well, that's where our King James translators, it's important to see that. But it's actually even more important to see the Hebrew. Not just because of what it's missing, but what's actually there. What's the word that is translated as well? She simply comes to her husband and says to him, Shalom. Which is the Hebrew word for peace. It's the peace of the temple. It's the peace that Solomon was named after. It's, it's the greeting that is made among, among Hebrew speakers. It's the, ulti- it's the aloha of the Hawaiians. It's love and goodness and kindness and peace and hello and goodbye and everything wrapped up into one magnificent word. And I love that this woman, she's one of my here Again, when I get to teach women in the scriptures, this is a woman we spend some extra time with. And I love that that's her response to tragedy. Absolute loss and devastation. And yet it's action and it's... I'm going to, things are going to be okay, and I'm going to bring this child to the prophet, and I'm going to bring the prophet to the child, and my husband doesn't get it, and he's totally confused, and that's okay. Shalom. I'm at peace concerning these things, and you can be too. It's all going to be okay. It'll work out. So there's my faith. Now where's my great anxiety? Get the servant, get the, get the donkey. We got to fly. My faith needs works, and I'm trying to give both. So verse 24. Then she saddled an ass. So didn't even wait for the servant to be able to come and do it. It's like, I, he may, he's going to need to drive the thing for me, but I can get this thing get started. She saddled the ass and said to her servant, drive and go forward. Slack not thy riding for me, except I bid thee. In other words, full speed ahead. Don't slow down for this little old lady. Uh, get this whip cracking and get this donkey flying because I've got to find the prophet of God. I wonder if we sometimes are guilty of slowing down God's servants. And I just want to make make sure this is a comfortable ride. And so ease into the natural man or woman in each of us and just take it easy. No, we we want the Lord to be able to hasten his work. We don't want the prophet to slow down for us. Back in President Hinckley's day, I remember Elder Ballard once saying, the only reason that President Hinckley ever comes back to Salt Lake in the middle of a world tour is to drop off the apostle that he wore out and pick up a fresh one. And he said, even among us apostles, we sometimes wonder, are we keeping up with him or are we slowing him down? Well, if that was true of President Hinckley, it's definitely true of President Nelson as well. I mean, who in his 90, what, 97, 98? (laughs) And he feels like it's fast, he's faster than we are. Well, don't slow down for me, President Nelson. I will do my best to keep up with you. I'm, just, I'm going to hang on for dear life and just try to keep speed. Well, what happens next? She went and came unto the man of God to Mount Carmel. Evidently, no slowing down needed. Mount Carmel, that's where he was? Oh, that's the scene of the Lord's victory over Baal back in Elijah's day. Huh, that's the scene where a drought turned into a rainstorm. Oh, where trials became blessings. Huh, that seems like a perfect place to find a prophet to reverse the tragedy that I just experienced. And it came to pass, when the man of God saw her afar off, that he said to Gehazi his servant, Behold, yonder is that Shunammite. Yes, prophets are good at recognizing whatever's coming, even if it's afar off. But he doesn't exactly know what's, what's the situation. In verse 26, he says to Gehazi, Run now, I pray thee, to meet her, and say unto her, Is it well with thee? Is it well with thy husband? Is it well with the child? Now, no offense, Elisha, but in a way, that's a very self-centered way of asking the questions, at least the order there. How are you doing? How's your spouse doing? How's your child doing? It's like these concentric circles, and the individual is the target, the bullseye. From the Shunammite woman's perspective, flip the order. I'm not here for me. I'm, not, I'm here for my child. 
So don't ask about my, how, my, how I'm doing first and my, how my child's doing last. Ask about the people that matter to me. It's, it, I love the inverting those concentric circles. How's everyone in my life? And then work into how's my own life doing? Uh, because that's a mother heart. That's a true disciple's heart. Lose yourself and, and end up finding yourself in the process. So flip it around. How's my child doing? Uh, ask about me last. My husband's somewhere in the middle. I mean, he's home asking weird questions about days of the week and stuff like that. Okay, But I'm here for the child. And as Gehazi runs out to ask her those questions, her response at the end of verse 26 is profound. She answered, it is well. And we still have those italicized, it is, from the King James translators. And yes, we have from the Hebrew original, shalom. What did she say to her husband who wasn't, uh, didn't know what was going on? It's going to be okay. I'm at peace. What does she say to this servant, Gehazi, that doesn't know what's going on? It's okay. I'm at peace. And what I really want to do is talk to the prophet. Because he's the one that's going to be able to truly bring the ultimate peace that we need. And so they continue the journey back. In verse 27, when she came to the man of God to the hill, always seems to be up at higher elevation, she caught him by the feet. There's bowing before him, true humility, there's desperation. But Gehazi came near to thrust her away. Sound like the apostles trying to keep the little children away from Jesus? Like, come on, there's some, some dignity here, some, some respectful distance. And yet Elisha stops him, not her. The man of God said, let her alone, for her soul is vexed within her, and the Lord hath hid it from me, and hath not told me. Let her alone. Let her mourn the way she needs to mourn. Let her feel what she's feeling. Don't try to solve the problem immediately. Just mourn with those that mourn. Don't try to tell her how she's supposed to react in this situation. Let her react however she's reacting. And then we'll move forward from there. Obviously, something deep is happening. I can sense at least the depth of anguish that she's in. Her soul is vexed. But I don't know the specifics beyond that. I'm discerning, but there's a limit to my discernment because it all is based on blessings from God. I know there, I knew it was her from a distance. I knew, I know there's something going on deep within, but I don't know anything more than that. And so I need to let her speak. Let her come. Let her mourn. Let her cry. Let her ask and let her reveal where she really is in all of this. This is the hard part as parents or as leaders or as friends when somebody's going through something so difficult but they just can't bring themselves to talk about it yet. And so what do we do? We don't make demands. We don't thrust people away. We let them come to a point and hopefully we can convince them that we're safe conversation partners so they know that they can come talk to us when they're ready. Well, she's ready by verse 28. She said, Did I desire a son of my Lord? Did I not say, Do not deceive me? In other words, I knew. <laughs> I didn't ask you for a baby. When you offered, what, what can we do for you? Do you need king's help? Do you need captain's help? I didn't even ask for God's help. I was content with what the Lord allotted me. I was great in so many other areas of my life. And no, I wasn't a mother, but I have a mother's heart. And I offered it to you made you that space, invited you in, sustained you, and that's all, I, that's all I needed. I just needed to be useful, and I, you gave me a use. You gave me a purpose, and, and I was okay with that. You were the one that suggested I have a child. And did you grant me that blessing just so God could take it away? This is just like the widow of Zarephath. And now another brokenhearted mother wondering why she was given a child to begin with. In a way, she's saying, I, it would have been better if it had never come. If I'd never had a child, because I was childless before and I'm childless now, it's the, it's the having in the middle that makes this so gut-wrenching. Was Shakespeare not correct when he said that it's better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all? 
she doesn't agree with him, that, at least not on that day. And maybe we feel sometimes like her also. But that is like what we saw earlier. Appreciate the blessing when it's here. Don't curse God that it's taken. Thank him that you ever had it at all. But that's probably too much to say to her at this point because of all she's going through. Thankfully, Elisha doesn't say it. Instead, he says in verse 29 to Gehazi, Gird up thy loins, take my staff in thine hand, and go thy way. If thou meet any man, salute him not. If any salute thee, answer him not again, and lay my staff upon the face of the child. Now again, this is Elisha delegating, sending Gehazi to do it. Now maybe this was because Gehazi had younger, fresher legs. And if this is a true 911 call, and her son just died on her lap, and they saddled the ass as quickly as possible, and, and sirens blazing uh, came screaming up here to the hill to find me. Go running back as quickly as you can. And take my staff, this is kind of Aaron's staff kind of moment, and go, this will help you perform the miracle that I would perform if I were there. But I'm okay to delegate. And so they go. Verse 30, the mother of the child said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy, as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And he arose and followed her. Interesting choice that she just made. Rather than rush back home with Gehazi to be there with her child, she stayed behind and went at the prophet's pace. Like I said, that's interesting to me. I, I think for me it would be, okay, you're, you're coming? Or your, your servant's going right now? Okay, i got to be back with my child immediately. I'm sad I was away from them this long. But no, her choice is to remain with the prophet. And I think sometimes when we're trying to reconnect life with death, a loved one that we've lost back to the God we never want to lose, whose side do we stay on? And this is a tricky one. This is a, a, a delicate balance. Of course, this is all meant for the child. But I think sometimes if we just go where the child goes in all of their wanderings, this is the the father of the prodigal that doesn't follow the child to that dis distant country. Instead, he stays on home, on home turf in, on godly ground. And here's this Shunammite woman, I'm going to stay with God. If anything good comes to my child, it will be because I'm still on God's side. I'm still here with the prophet. And the blessings can then flow according to God's timetable. And so she stays while Gehazi runs. In verse 31, Gehazi passed on before them. He laid the staff upon the face of the child, but there was neither voice nor hearing. It didn't work. Wherefore, he went again to meet him. He's making the return trip as they're still making their way towards this woman's home. He told him, saying, the child is not awaked. It didn't, it didn't happen. It didn't go according to our plan. This is... Jesus, as he comes down the Mount of Transfiguration with Peter, James, and John, and the other nine apostles are wringing their hands, concerned that we couldn't heal this man's son, even though we believed we could, and he thought that we could too. It didn't work. Well, what's Jesus' response to them? Oh, ye of little faith. You need to believe more than you did. Is that the same problem here? Well, notice how the story unfolds. Verse 32, when Elisha was come into the house, finally got there. Behold, the child was dead and laid upon his bed. He went in, therefore, and shut the door upon them twain and prayed unto the Lord. No spectators, just participants. This is like Jesus raising the daughter of Jairus. This is Elijah up on that, that upper room with the, the son of the widow of Zarephath. This is a chance just for God to work through his prophet and eliminate all other distractions that are out there. Verse 34, he went up and lay upon the child and put his mouth upon his mouth and his eyes upon his eyes and his hands upon his hands. He stretched himself upon the child and the flesh of the child waxed warm. Then he returned and walked in the house to and fro and went up and stretched himself upon him and the child sneezed seven times, and the child opened his eyes. Now, this is a strange miracle. Again, there's echoes of Elijah's earlier experiences when he stretched himself upon the dead son of the widow of Zarephath. 
and he came back to life. Similar thing is happening here. The, the seven sneezes, that's odd too. What do we say when somebody sneezes? We say, God bless you. Uh, because some believe that, oh, the heart must stop, or you're expelling the breath of life with such violence that, oh, your life's on the line here. Well, so may God bless you for the breath of life to return so you can keep breathing and the heart keep ticking. Seven sneezes, well, there's the seven of creation, the totality, the completeness, the ultimate blessing, life returning. Now, that's quite the gazuntite, right? Right? In verse 36, he, he called Gehazi and said, Call this Shunammite. So he called her, and when she was coming unto him, he said, Take up thy son. I can't help but think of Michelangelo's Pieta with that phrase. That magnificent sculpture of Mary holding the lifeless body of her son, Jesus, on her lap as he's been taken down from the cross. Take up thy son. She did it in death. This Shunammite woman was doing it in life. And that's the role reversal that the atonement of Christ makes possible. That, that Mary would take up her child who was dead so that we can all take up our children or loved ones and live because of that death. And when she went in, the Shunammite woman fell at his feet and bowed herself to the ground and took up her son and went out. Did you catch the order there? To fall and bow before she takes up and goes? That is humility and gratitude and worship and praise before she even receives or obtains the blessing. I love the, this Shunammite woman. It's hard to think of a better example in Scripture of someone who puts others first before self, of someone who's content to accept the Lord's will, whatever it might be, someone that can be at peace, shalom, in the midst of heartbreak and tragedy and loss, someone who tries to reassure others along the way, even when her heart is breaking inside, someone who looks for ways to make space to bring God into her life and then provide for for prophets, start to finish, everything you see about her is absolutely in incredible. But here to me is the crescendo, the climax of every lesson she teaches. Because in the miracle of the raising of her son, I see one of the most profound analogies, illustrations of the atonement of Christ you'll find anywhere in scripture. It's one of my all-time favorites. I just remember reading this once and, and pondering it and thinking about what Elisha needed to learn by his failure in trying to heal the boy the first time. And it struck me. Originally, Elisha assumed, well, this is something that can be taken care of through someone else. I can delegate it. Gehazi can take care of this. I can, it can be performed from a distance. In fact, with the help of my staff, even better, just bring that and hold it over him and and he'll be fine. But he wasn't. And I thought to myself, okay, Elisha, what do you need to learn here? You need to learn that some miracles can't be performed at a distance. Some miracles can't take place through delegation. Some things you have to come and do it yourself. Some things you have to be personally present for. And all of a sudden, the Spirit opened the eyes of my understanding, and I understood the condescension of Christ in a way I'd never had before. How do we solve the problems of sin and death for the human race? How do we reverse the fall and make every wrong thing right again? Does God just have a magic wand that he wields in heaven and waves away our sins and sufferings? No. No. It's not the staff that's going to do it. And it's not even something that I'm going to delegate. Christ will come. And he who would atone for all of us personally entered our mortal space. This is the incarnation, the word made flesh. This is the condescension to come down, to be with us. But not even just to be with us, to be like 
us. Because even when Elisha enters the room and sees this boy, how is the miracle performed? He lays down upon him. He mirrors his mortality. That is condescension. That is Christ taking upon himself humanity and all that goes with it. That's Christ in Gethsemane wanting to feel not just our sins, but the sorrows we feel for those sins. It was the perfect empathy he gained because of his perfect atonement. It's as if Jesus were entering that room and seeing our lifeless body and taking it upon himself. Body to body, form to form. As if Jesus were saying, for, for life to flow into death, I have to take death upon myself. I need to breathe through their lifeless mouths. I need to see through their blind eyes. I need to feel through their calloused hands. And only by doing that, by condescending to their level, to going beneath all things, do I ever hope to raise them up. Only then can my life flow into their death. That's what happened in that sacred space, in that little room. And I don't care how many times you sneeze out the breath of life that I'm trying to force back into you. I won't give up on you until you are perfectly whole. And life has returned. The breath of the life. And he's breathing it into us. One of my favorite phrases from a Christmas song, not one of the carols we normally sing, but a more modern Christian song sung at Christmas about the incarnation and the condescension. It's called Welcome to Our World. It's what we're saying to this baby Jesus as he lies in the manger. Oh, having to see through our blindness and take upon himself death is still decades in the future, but welcome. In that song, though, as it speaks of what was coming for this little baby, my favorite lines, So wrap our injured flesh around you. Breathe our air, walk our sod, rob our sin and make us holy, perfect Son of God, perfect Son of God. Welcome to our world. That is what Jesus did when he came. That is what Elisha is feeling as he enters this room and exchanges death for life. I, I hope that the Holy Ghost somehow, as you ponder these things, as you read these words, can see Christ there. It, it's one of the most profound types and shadows for Jesus that I've ever seen. And still the miracles aren't done. In this magnificent chapter, two more that follow. Verse 38 through 41. There are sons of the prophets in an area still suffering with famine. It hadn't ended everywhere. And Elisha tells them to go make some soup. So the nice thing about soup is you just add water to whatever you can find. And hopefully that spreads it out, dilutes it a bit, but it gives some people a chance to eat. They go out and they find some wild gourds. Gather them in, that's all they can find, and they throw it into the pot and cook it. They begin to eat and realize that those gourds were inedible. Probably poisonous because the way they say it, there's death in this pot. But, unperturbed, he who was able to bring life out of death already in this chapter, what does he do? He takes a little handful of meal, well, that's all you need in the hands of a prophet, and he casts it into the pot, and the food miraculously becomes edible. It goes from, there is death in the pot, to, there was no harm in the pot. That's what just happened for the Shunammite woman's son. From death to no harm. That's what the Lord does in all of our trials and, and troubles. He goes from famine to a feast of fat things. He goes from death to life. He takes a, just a handful of meal, just a pinch of manna, and throws it in. And it brings flavor and goodness and life back to us. It's what the gospel does. 
Then one other uh, miracle in this chapter, 42 to 44. This time a man brings some of the first fruits of his harvest to Elisha. And Elisha tells him, share it with everyone. Share it with all the people. The man responds in verse 43. What, should I set this before a hundred men? Well, you shouldn't have asked because yes, or however many hundreds there are. Elisha says, give the people that they may eat. For thus saith the Lord, they shall eat and shall leave thereof. So he set it before them and they did eat and left thereof according to the word of the Lord. How many miracles like this do we need to see before we actually believe that they're possible? We saw Elijah and the widow of Zarephath multiplying the meal and the oil. We saw this woman, perhaps the wife of Obadiah, in Elisha's ministry, multiplying oil as she poured it out to fill the empty vessels. Here we see feeding a multitude when this man knows he doesn't have enough for everyone. This is Jesus feeding the 5,000 or the 4,000, taking whatever we have to offer. And between the needs of the people and the blessings of God, that's the great combination. Your willingness to share, to offer, to give whatever you have, seeing the needs of those around you that go beyond what you could possibly do on your own, trusting that God somehow can make you capable or sufficient, and then it happens. The miracle meets the needs. If you take these two miracles described at the end of 2 Kings chapter 4 and combine them, they teach an incredible lesson from two angles. The first, you take something bad and turn it into something good. The second, you take something insufficient and turn it into something sufficient. In a way, we've gone from bad to good in the first miracle and from good to better in the second. We pulled the weeds in the first. We planted flowers in the second. Justification happens in the first. Sanctification occurs in the second. And just to see the atonement of Christ being able to perform both of those miracles, this is the preventative power as well as the restorative power. This is all that Jesus does to not only pull us out of our pits, but also to help us ascend the mountain, to get us to the point where we're like him. Now that's chapter 4, which is an absolute masterpiece. How do you follow that? With another masterpiece in chapter 5. This one, equally famous, is the story of Naaman the leper. But let's get beyond the surface level and look at every word. In verse 1, now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria. Wait, Syria? The ones that keep fighting against Israel and Judah? Yeah, that's Syria. And his general, chief captain? Yeah, well... The Lord is concerned about all of his children. He was a great man with his master. This man is trustworthy. He's obedient. No wonder he's trusted with the army. He's honorable, which would suggest his honesty, his integrity, because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. I told you God cared about all of his kids. Even those outside of Israel, he is seeking their deliverance, their redemption, and he can work through people outside the covenant to bring blessings to his people wherever they might be. So this is a miracle. This is a man that God has blessed and used to bless others outside of Israel. Keep reading his description. He was also a mighty man in valor. So his courage, his bravery, no wonder he's a military man. But, our final phrase, he was a leper. And tragically, that seems to be what we know about him most. Ask anybody, what do you know about Naaman? And, oh, the, you mean the leper that was healed? Yeah, yeah, the leper. Why couldn't you have said, you mean the brave man? The courageous man? The man of integrity and of honor? The man that God raised up and used for divine purposes, even outside the, the household of faith? That guy? Yeah, that guy. Oh, he ha didn't he happen to have, yeah, yeah, he had leprosy. But... Why would you let someone's weakness eclipse all of their strengths? It's tragic to think of people being reduced down to their, but he was a fill-in-the-blank condition. Yeah, she's amazing, but she... Can we, can we keep things in proper perspective? And Naaman was as good as they come. Verse 2, he's not the only one that knows it. Even his enemies seem to sense it. You see here, the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel, a little maid, and she waited on Naaman's wife. Now, you're a prisoner of war? Just this little girl that was 
snatched away from home and hearth and was brought into enemy territory to become a servant? Well, there doesn't seem to be any harshness or hard feelings on her part because of what happens next. Like I said, she seems to be as supportive of Naaman as the king of Syria himself would be. Perhaps she saw past Naaman's leprosy and saw the goodness of his heart. In verse 3, she said unto her mistress, Would God my Lord were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. Unlike most people of that time period that assumed that all suffering is caused by sin, she didn't think less of Naaman, didn't assume that this is, oh, he probably deserves it. He's getting what's coming to him, especially for all the things that he did against Israel or what he did against me. No, she simply sees someone amazing that, has, uh, that is in suffering and thinks there's got to be a way to, to help. And the thought comes, Elisha... <sighs> His reputation has been spreading. Here's a man who can do anything. He provides life in death. He, he multiplies loaves and fishes. He, surely he can help this man, my master. Verse 4, one went in and told his Lord, saying, Thus and thus said the maid that is of the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Wow, this escalated quickly. We went from little maid to her mistress, the wife of Naaman. She must have then told him. Somehow the word got up to the king. And now the king says, go to, go. I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. I'll, I'll put in a good word for you. I mean, you're my right-hand man, and I'll talk king to king with my counterpart in Israel, and we'll take care of things. And so he departed and took with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 pieces of gold, 10 changes of raiment. This is an incredible amount of wealth. It shows how much the king of Syria values Naaman and how much Naaman values his health. Well, let's go take care of this. And so he goes. Now, verse 6, he brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, Now when this letter is come unto thee, behold, I have therewith sent Naaman my servant to thee, that thou mayest recover him of the leprosy. Notice he didn't go to Elisha, even though he's the one that this little maid was talking about. I have a feeling that it was the king that kind of looked like, wait, some prophet over there? Yeah, right. Uh, but kings can handle things. Uh, at least I hope this one can. I can't. Uh, but send the message to the king. King, it's on you now. However you need to do it, whoever you've got in your kingdom that you might call to, to the rescue, but you need to help my, my servant here. You, I get a sense that the king of Syria ranks kings over prophets course he would, uh, and thinks that it's the king of Israel that's going to make Naaman whole. Well, verse 7, it came to pass when the king of Israel had read the letter that he rent his clothes and said, am I God to kill and to make alive that this man would just send unto me to recover a man of his leprosy? Wherefore consider, I pray you, and see how he seeketh a quarrel against me. You see, the king of Israel knows better. It's, I can't do anything here. I don't outrank anybody in this realm. Only God can pull off something like this. This must be some plot on the part of the king of Syria. He wants to come up with some kind of an excuse to attack me. And so he sends me with an impossible mission to perform and then will use that as justification to destroy me since I couldn't help, his, I couldn't help my enemy. I'm a dead man. Well, Elisha finds out Again, speaking of recognizing things from afar, he, he finds out that the king of Israel is beside himself with, dis, with stress, and so he sends a messenger to find out what's going on. Verse 8, Wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? Let him come now to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. The king will know it too. The people will know it too. The world needs to know this. That's what we saw back in the book of Exodus. Uh, why all these plagues? Why all these miracles? Because people don't know God and they need to. So, king, don't worry your pretty little head. Just send the not-so-pretty little head of Naaman, with all that leprosy, send him my way. And the world will know that God can take care of this. I mean, isn't that what you said earlier, king of Israel? Am I God? No, you're not. And neither am I, so it's not me or you that's going to be doing the healing, but God can if he'll just come and do as God commands. So, Naaman comes. Verse 9. He came with his horses and with his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. Talk about a shock and awe introduction. Here I am, military trappings. And Elisha sent a messenger unto him. 
I told you he likes to delegate, uh, but even on this level, to the right hand man of the king of Syria and the king of Israel is, is, is pr pressing for this as well, and you're just going to send out your servant? Yeah, why not? Uh, for this one, I don't need to come out personally. I learned that lesson the last time. This one does, doesn't need it. Uh, is this a way to show how unimpressed I am with Naaman's position and power? I don't care about your horses and chariots. I'm not even curious to see how, how much they shine in the sun. Gehazi, go out and take care of this, will you? And here's the message. Go and wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. That's it. So simple. So understated. <laughs> As if Naaman has, it's never crossed his mind that I could just wash and be clean. Are you kidding me? <laughs> that, is, that is offensive to me. That you would come up with a solution, quote unquote, that is so beneath my dignity and even beneath the severity of what I'm going through. Why aren't you taking things as seriously as I am? I think we're guilty of that sometimes. When the Lord's solutions seem so inadequate to meet the world's needs, and so we almost get offended at God, like, don't you care? My family's falling apart and you talk about singing songs and playing games on a, on a family home evening? Or look at the world around us and all we're doing is out trying to share simple scripture stories and bear testimony of the, of the atonement of Christ. Now that is sufficient for the need, believe me. That's all it takes. It's amazing how simple it is. It's so simple that nobody's doing it. But if we would do it, the world would change. So do it, Naaman. Well, he's not ready for that yet. Verse 11, Naaman was wroth, and we see why. He went away and said, Behold, I thought he will surely come out to me. I'm that important, after all. I thought he would stand and call on the name of the, God, of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. I mean, surely my shock and awe display of military power would be met by some shock and awe display of his spiritual power, right? I came forth. Wouldn't he come forth? And it's kind of this man-to-man -man moment, and all of a sudden the power of God is called down upon me, and, and I'm healed? Where was that? He goes on. Are not Abana and Farpar rivers of Damascus, where I'm from, the capital of Syria? Aren't those better than all the waters of Israel? There's a little nationalism on his part, a little local pride. But may I not wash in them and be clean? If that's all it is. So he turned and went away in a rage. It's interesting the way that verse began. Started with anger and ended with anger, right? From wrath to rage. Seems like it's escalating as he talks out loud. But notice what he said at the beginning. Behold, I thought. I expected things to go a certain way, and they didn't. I assumed and it didn't go according to my assumption. It's interesting how often what devastates us is not the circumstance we're in, but the difference between the circumstance we're in and the circumstance we expected to be in. It's unmet expectations that so often is the, the thief of joy. If he would have come in with a blank slate and just, I don't know how he's going to do it, but if they say he can, and that little maid was pretty convincing, um, Okay, I'm, I'm at your service. Uh, anything you need me to do, uh, I don't know how this is going to work. I don't even know if, if it's going to work. We'll see that later with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? I, I know God can save us, but if he doesn't, I'm okay with that too. No expectation of outcome. Just total trust in God. We have to be better at... I'm not saying lower expectations, because God can surpass all of them, even the loftiest. The question is, will he? And to understand and honor his will, to be submissive and meek and, and open, we can't come with thinking that this is how it's supposed to be or how it has to be. And anything less than that, anything different from that, is going to cause me to, be, to rage against the source of my blessings. We struggle with unmet expectations all the time, and I think they cause us to curse God, thinking that He doesn't know what we need. 
No, he does know what we need better than we do, which is why sometimes he answers us in a way that we did not expect. It's when we pray for bread and assume that, G that God has come with a rock. But as Jesus says in the New Testament, even we mere mortals know how to do better than that. No, there's... If your mission wasn't to the place you expected, it was to the place that God needed you. If your children didn't turn out as expected, it's because God gave you the children that needed you and that you needed. If the miracle you're praying for doesn't come the way or the time that you'd planned, we've got to learn to trust God. And eventually, hopefully we'll be able to say in humility, thank you for not listening to me. It's not that you didn't meet my needs. It's that you didn't meet my expectations. And it's my expectations that were wrong. You knew my needs. And all is well. Well, is Naaman going to get there? Verse 13, his servants came near and spake unto him and said, My father, kind title. They looked up to him. They loved him. If the prophet had bid thee do some great thing, wouldst thou not have done it? How much rather than when he saith to thee, wash and be clean. It's so simple. Then let it be simple. You would have done it if it wasn't. I think too often we want to lift everything to the level of epic and legend and myth. And, oh, it has to be the Herculean labors. Okay? And if I can perform those Herculean labors, then the miracle will come. Where God really is. Simple is the way. But few there be there that find it. If you'll just do as I ask, just exercise faith and repent of your sins and be baptized by water and by the Spirit and endure to the end. Just, you want spiritual strength? Then do the primary answers. Read your scriptures and pray and go to church and serve, attend the temple. Well, no, 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 no. It's got to be something huge. Well, that's huge in its consistency. But I'm not asking you to to move a mountain in one fell swoop. Do the small and simple things, because that's what this whole story has been about from the very first verse. Who started the process? Oh, a little maid. Who did it go to from there? Oh, a, a wife at home. Where did it go from there? Well, it went to Naaman, and it went to the king of Syria, and it went to the king of... Israel, and then it went back to the mighty prophet of Israel. But what did he do? Took it back down <laughs> to a mere servant again. In fact, who's talking to you now, Naaman? Oh, your servants? Let's keep it all on this lowly level. Let's keep it simple. And just, are you willing to lower yourself to that level? Because humility is what's required. Maybe that's your Herculean labor. Put off the natural man. Approach me as a child, meek and submissive, willing to suffer anything that the Lord seeth fit to inflict upon them. But become a true saint. Become a child. That's what I'm asking. If you were a little bit more like that little maid, Naaman, all would be well. And the same goes for you and me. Are we waiting for the most dramatic mission call? Or are we willing to just share our feelings about the gospel here and now? Are we waiting to magnify a calling that's really worth magnifying? Uh, you know, I mean, the, the big high profile ones. Or am I willing to magnify any calling I get along the way? Or magnify my efforts to bless people even with no calling at all? That's one of our problems. I, even as I talk with people about my years at divinity school, and sometimes they'll say, oh, I just, I want to go to divinity school like you did. I want to know the scriptures that way. And I kind of laugh and think, I didn't learn the scriptures at divinity school. I learned religious history and, and all kinds of other topics and things, but scripture, that just came from the last 35 years or so of reading my scriptures every single day. And line upon line, and precept upon precept, and insight by insight, and here a little, there a little. It's just small and simple things. And great things are brought to pass in the aggregate. 
combining them all. So don't, don't worry, Naaman. This is a great thing. <laughs> Bigger than you realize in its smallness. So be as small as it. Become a child. Do the primary answers. And become clean. In verse 14, he does. He listened to these servants. He humbled himself. And he went down. Even the direction speaks of lowering himself. He dipped himself seven times in Jordan. According to the saying of the man of God, I'll do it his way instead of my way. And his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child. And he was clean. I love the way it's described because that's what he's been being aimed towards all along. Will you become childlike? And once he did, then he ended up with the flesh of a little child. You want the flesh of a little child, you're going to need the heart of a little child first. So lower yourself to that level of trust, obedience, overcome your stubbornness and pride. Oh, and you'll become a little child again. And he did. Verse 15, he returned to the man of God, he and all his company, and came and stood before him. And he said, Behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. It's not the Syrian rivers. It's not the Syrian God. Well, it's not the Israelite river either. But it is the Israelite God. The God of Israel is the God over the whole earth, and now a Syrian knows it. Will that make a difference in the kingdoms of Syria? Naaman's already been used to bring deliverance to his people uh, politically. Will he now be able to go home and bring deliverance to his people spiritually? I wish we knew the rest of the story of Naaman once he gets home. But let's see a few more details before he gets there. Verse 15, Now therefore I pray thee, Take a blessing of thy servant. In other words, what can I give you? I brought all of this, this wealth from Syria. Take it all. But Elisha says, As the Lord liveth before whom I stand, I will receive none. He urged him to take it. I insist. But he refused. And Elisha won the day on this one. He was more insistent. You see, that wealth, all that you brought, was never my motivation. I didn't even go out to look at it. I don't, I don't care. I... You needed to be content with what God has given you. I am content with what God gave me. So please don't pay me. That was not my motivation at the start. It cannot become my motivation after the fact. I don't want to touch priestcraft with a 10-foot pole. And he doesn't. But then Naaman's response, 17, fascinating verse. Naaman says, Shall there not then, I pray thee, be given to thy servant two mules burden of earth? For thy servant will henceforth offer neither burnt offering nor sacrifice unto other gods, but unto the Lord. Now, when I was young and I read that, I was only thinking about, okay, he keeps trying to, no, you got to take something. I insist. No, 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 it's priestcraft. I don't want any of it. It's like, okay, fine. Will, will you at least, can I give to thy servant two mules burden of earth? And I assumed that he was referring to Gehazi. That's Elisha's servant. Can I give him two mules burden of earth? Now, what is that? And I pictured, like, what's the burden of a mule? Is it like how far he can plow in a day? And so two mules burden. Let me just carve out some land in Syria or just give you enough property to pay you back. And if you don't want it, fine. Can I give it to your servant? I just, I'm so grateful. You got to understand. And I want to give this to you or to him. Maybe it'll come back to bless you somehow. Well, I was wrong in that. Because what he's really saying, and it's actually even more amazing, when he says, can I give to thy servant? He's not talking about Gehazi. He's talking about himself. I am thy humble servant, Elisha. Uh, I am nothing compared to you. I may be second in command in Syria, but I'm nowhere here compared to you. Here, this really is the little child humility speaking. So can I please have this blessing then? Will you give? You, you won't let me give anything to you. Well, will you give something to me? Above and beyond everything that the Lord your God has already given. All I'm asking for is two mules burden worth of earth. In other words, will you let me fill up enough sacks of Israelite soil from right here around your house, fill it with bags, or fill bags with it, and then put those bags on, on mules? And can I have enough earth, enough Israelite soil to, to weigh down two mules? Uh, what? Why? <laughs> That's weird. You just needed a souvenir? Uh, 
No, this is what I'm asking for. Notice how what he says at the end of that verse. I'm not going to offer sacrifice or burnt offerings unto any other God but the Lord. In fact, in verse 18, it helps us understand this a little bit more too. In this thing, the Lord pardon thy servant, that when my master goeth into the house of Rimon, which is the, a god of Syria, to worship there, and he leaneth on my hand, and I bow myself in the house of Rimon, when I bow down myself in the house of Rimon, the Lord pardon thy servant in this thing. In other words, i got to go home. And uh, Syrian gods are worshipped on Syrian soil. And I'm just afraid, now that I've fully converted to the God of Israel, he's the only one that could help me. And I've made a covenant now with you that there is no other God in all the earth but the God of Israel. I know that now, and I want to maintain that commitment to him and him alone. From verse 18, the concern is, I'm going to go home, and I'm still the king's right-hand man. And when the king goes to church, quote-unquote, it's going to be in a Syrian temple to a Syrian God and as far as I know now, that's a false god that can do us no good. But what am I going to do? I'm going to stand up to the king and <laughs> refuse? No, I'm still his servant, but I really want to be the servant of the Lord, your God. And so, on verse 18, the, the, the hope is, please forgive me. That's why he says, the Lord pardon thy servant. May, please forgive me when I step foot into a, Syrian, a pagan Syrian temple. It's not my intent. I just, I'm the servant of the king and I'll have to go where he goes. But I'm not trying to be sacrilegious. I'm not trying to blaspheme. I'm not trying to be disloyal to the God of Israel. That is now I'm claiming as my own. And that is what makes sense with the other side of things in verse 17. I need some, some Israelite soil to make a little plot of Israelite ground back home in Damascus. And then I will worship there. I'll set up an altar there, or maybe some, if you can throw some rocks in with the dirt, then we can make our own little Israelite altar right there in enemy territory, in foreign land. And I will worship a, a God of the foreigners who I want to feel welcome in my land. You see, he still believes the same that most people at that time period believe, that there are provincial pantheons. And every land has its own God. And the God of the land is the one you have to appease. And so the Philistines have Philistine gods for Philistine land. And Canaanites versus Israelites, Egyptians, Syrians, you name it. And so, I mean, he's a new convert, okay? Some old habits and philosophies die hard. And so here's Naaman assuming for God to feel welcome, it has to be in his land of promise. So can we make some of that promised land portable land? And load up my mules and bring it home, and then I'll set up a little annex to Israel in Damascus. And I promise I will worship the Lord there. Now, a few things that we need to overcome if any of that mentality has seeped into our own. God is the God of the whole world, the whole universe. And there is no other God beside him. And so no worry about needing Israelite soil. You don't, <laughs> he'll feel just as welcome in Syria. Don't worry. Why do you think he was working on you and through you even before you came and knew him at all? He knew you. You were worth knowing. So don't worry about that. I think in some ways for us, I loved my, I spent a semester in Israel and loved it. I came home feeling deep, more deeply than ever that, that that land is holy for good reason. But my testimony of Christ, I had more experiences than I had before, but my testimony was no different. In fact, I've, I've often told people, I have two holy lands. One is Israel, because of what Jesus did there. But the other for me was Puerto Rico, because of what God let me do there as a missionary. Uh, and I didn't have to come to know, I didn't have to go to Israel to come to know Christ. I came to know him in California and Texas as a, as a kid, in Utah and, and Tennessee as an adult. I've come to know Christ everywhere I've been. Or... My time, trip to the Sacred Grove, it was wonderful. But I already had a testimony of what happened there before I ever came there myself. In fact, it was a little anticlimactic when I got there because we had so many little kids that were trying to scurry off in places that there was no sense of reverence at all. In fact, as we were leaving the Sacred Grove, and I just felt like I'd missed out on something as I was hurting cats, right? Hurting children. Uh, they were small. Then I, we loaded up the car and I was about to pull out of the parking lot, and I turned to my wife and just said, 
can I just have like five minutes, please, to myself and just Sacred Grove alone? It was almost closing time. And, and she was, oh, of course. And that's when I had a sacred experience in the Sacred Grove. But like I said, I had sacred experiences about the Sacred Grove before ever going there in person. So don't worry about the, the dirt, Naaman. You don't need it. And the other part too, don't worry about going back to Syria and having to rub shoulders with those who worship the Syrian gods. If that's all they know, that's all they know, and that's okay. It's not sacrilegious of you to go to church with someone that you no longer share their religious beliefs. I love going to churches with other people. I find beauty there. I find peace there. I find truth there. I'm always grateful to come home and feel the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But I have a lot of holy envy. And I think that's an okay thing from, from Naaman's perspective. You're not going to worship their gods. You know the true God. In our case, most of the churches we go to, they're worshiping the true God too. So no worries there. I just may have different ways of doing it. But don't worry, Naaman, if your heart's in the right place, then you'll never be in the wrong place. So go forward. In verse 19, he said unto him, go in peace. Nothing to worry about here. So he departed from him a little way. But Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said, ah, Behold, my master hath spared Naaman the Syrian in not receiving at his hands that which he brought. But as the Lord liveth, I will run after him and take somewhat of him. I mean, my master may not want any of this wealth, but I sure could use it. I'm a, I'm a lowly servant after all. Uh, and Elisha never seems to take anything for himself, which means he doesn't have much to, to give me, and, and I could use some of this. Ah, what a waste for Naaman to bring all this wealth from so far and not... I mean, this will help him too. He wanted to give it. He'll be able to feel like, okay, yes, I'm being grateful and showing that, that gratitude. Yeah, this is a favor for, for Naaman. Okay. And yeah, maybe my master just doesn't realize how much we need. Uh, and so this is, I'm doing a favor for Elisha this way. Yeah, yeah, okay. Now, I'd love to give Gehazi the, the benefit of the doubt on this. Unfortunately, these were selfish and self-centered motives. You see this as the story unfolds. Gehazi runs, catches up to Naaman off at a distance, who turns around and says, Whoa, every, everything okay? Everything all right? And Gehazi responds in verse 22, Oh yes, all is well. My master hath sent me, that's his first lie, saying, Behold, even now there be come to me from Mount Ephraim two young men of the sons of the prophets. That's his second lie. He's just making up a story to justify his greed. And so please give them, not me, it's not for me, it's not for my master, we're no, no priestcraft here, but please give them, these two young men, I pray thee, a talent of silver and two changes of garments. See, it's perfect. Two garment, two sets of clothing for the two young men that have come. They came with nothing, and so... We're trying to be hospitable, but we don't have much to offer. Maybe that's why Elisha didn't want to come out and see you at first, didn't want you to come into the house, because we're just our, our, how destitute we are. So if you could do them a favor, yeah, them, that's right, then please give me some of this. I, I, it's nothing compared to what you had originally offered. You had come with 10 changes of raiment. I only, they only need two. You had come with 10 talents of silver and 6,000 pieces of gold. And, and what do they, I mean, just one talent of silver would probably be more than enough for them. Them, right? They're the ones that need it. Oh, oh okay. Naaman is, is thrilled that he has an opportunity to show his gratitude and help someone in need since he's been helped in his need. In fact, he goes above and beyond. So I know that they only need one talent, but can I at least give you two? That's still nothing compared to what I intended to give your master. But I insist. Here it is. And Gehazi takes it and goes home. Where there are no two sons of the prophets from Ephraim waiting. Instead, there's a prophet waiting who has the eyes of a seer and can see better than Gehazi realizes. Verse 25, Gehazi went in, stood before his master, and Elisha said unto him, Whence comest thou, Gehazi? Where you been? And he said, uh, thy servant went no whither. Uh, so there's another lie trying to cover his tracks. I've been here the whole time. But Elisha says, went not mine heart with thee? 
when the man turned again from his chariot to meet thee? The Lord's eyes have been on you the whole time, my friend. Is it a time to receive money and to receive garments and olive yards and vineyards and sheep and oxen and men servants and maid servants? With that, I picture Gehazi protesting and going, no, 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 I didn't ask for olive yards, vineyards, sheep, oxen, men servants, maid servants, nothing. Uh, but you were right on the money and the garments. Uh, I'm really ashamed. I love that Elisha expands what he's describing here. Because it's not the specific things that you took. Rather, it's the general attitude that led you to take them. Because if you don't control that, then are you going to be content with money and clothing? No. You'll end up killing Naboth for his vineyard. You'll end up turning, trading in the house of God for a palace of gold. If there's one thing I've been learning from Israelite history, Elisha could say, it's that we need to put God first and not the things of the world. It's that we need to control the desires and lusts of the flesh or the worldliness of the heart. We just need to put God first and then be content with whatever he gives us. Gehazi, you've done wrong. You cannot turn a prophet, P-R-O-P-H-E-T, into profit, P-R-O-F-I-T. It's all about prophethood and not profiteering, he could say. It, it's about being a priest and not pay, making priesthood into priestcraft. No. We need to honor God, and God will honor us. I, I think, again, if we go beyond just the thought of priestcraft here, but the thought of making money our master... And focusing solely on olive yards and vineyards and sheep and, ox, sheep and oxen and everything else. I remember in college, this was such an interesting experience. I had, I wanted to be an architect when I grew up, and at the time in high school, and at BYU, it was where I was going to go to school, and I didn't. They didn't have an architecture program, and that was okay. There was a better one in California that I wanted to go to anyway. But I thought, let me go to BYU, uh, and deep in my religious uh, understanding, and I'll study civil engineering. I had a scholarship at the time, so college was going to be paid for anyway. I might as well have a, a degree that will help me in graduate school for architecture. And civil engineering, that way I can learn the construction side of things, and that'll help once I get to the design side of things. That was my uh, assumption, my, my plan. Anyway, uh, I had applied for a bunch of scholarships out of, coming out of high school, and one of them was, uh, was from the BMW and the, uh, the I don't know, Society of American Engineers or something like that. I don't even remember. But uh, they were kind enough and generous enough to, offer me, to grant me this scholarship, and it was, three, if I remember correctly, it was $3,000 a year for four years to study engineering in college, and that was my plan. So I thought, great, $12,000 to help me get through college. Um, thank you, BMW. I'll never be able to afford one of your cars, but I'll, I'll take your, your gift. Thank you. And the American Society of Engineers, I want to be among you. And so, so thank you for helping me with my education. Well, my freshman year at BYU, I, my major was civil engineering. And I took geology for engineers. And I was trying to take some prerequisites for the, pro, for the rest of the program and so on before my mission. Uh, and then I went on my mission and realized that <laughs> I don't want to build buildings as much as I want to build the kingdom of God. And... I don't know how, what kind of an architect I would have been anyway. I'd rather build faith. So let's focus on that. And I just want to teach. And so I came home from my mission thoroughly convinced. I just want to be a seminary and institute teacher for the rest of my life and just teach the gospel. It's the closest thing to being a missionary I, I could ever do. And so forget civil engineering. And I changed my major to history thinking, well, I can study religious history this way, and there's fewer credits required, which would give me all kinds of extra credits uh, available on my, in my four years, or my three years left, to take as many religion classes as I possibly can, and, and Bible as literature in the English department, and anything that I can kind of create my own program to try to become a teacher of the gospel. Well, that was all fine and good until I realized, oh, BMW isn't paying me to become a seminary teacher. And the American Society of Engineers doesn't care about me constructing faith. And 
and I can't in good conscience take another $9,000 when the purpose of them giving me that money no longer applies. So I wrote a letter to BMW and the American Society of Engineers and I thanked them for the $3,000 they gave, gave me three years before. So thank you, that helped me get through my freshman year. And uh, I loved my time studying civil engineering, but this is what I've been doing for the last two years and I love this even more. And I kind of shared with BMW, whoever it was that, that, that I wrote to, uh, that this is, I, have, I had a life-changing experience sharing with people the gospel of Jesus Christ and I just want to spend the rest of my life doing it. And uh, that means I'm no longer an engineering major and you need to keep the other $9,000. They actually wrote a really kind letter back and they said, uh, thank you so much for being honest with us. And uh, we really wished that we could give you the rest of your scholarship because you really did earn it. And we wanted it. To, we awarded it to you uh, for, for good reason. And but you're right. Uh, we wish you well in this new path of life, but it has nothing to do with with our fields of endeavor. And so. I wish we could keep, give you the other 9,000, but you're probably right. I guess we should keep it and give it to somebody else. And I was like, why, do you, why are you apologizing? I, you're doing what I told you to do. Thank you. Keep your money. But I remember at the time I was talking to a roommate just about this going back and forth with BMW. And I remember him saying, uh, in all honesty and, and kindness himself, just saying, you love engineering. You, you like engineering. You, want it, you, want it, you still love architecture. And you can still be a seminary teacher with a civil engineering degree. You could have just kept the degree uh, and kept the scholarship. It still would have been honest on your part. Seminary Institute doesn't care what your, what your degree was in. And then he said something that struck me so comically that it stuck in my mind. Because he said, you're going to kiss goodbye $9,000 to be a seminary teacher? And again, when you're a starving college student, that's, that does seem like a huge sacrifice. But the way he said it was so funny because it hit me and I said to him in response, Oh, believe me, I'm kissing away, I'm kissing goodbye way more than $9,000. <laughs> Whatever I could have been, whether it was an architect or an engineer or going into business or whatever other fields of endeavor are wonderful and, on, and, and righteous and support a family, they would make a lot more money than I would ever make teaching seminary. And so I just laughed. I'm like, no, this is only the first occasion of me saying no to the, to the gifts of the world so I can go just try to focus on building the kingdom of God. I'll be repeating this every two weeks for the rest of my life pretty much. And, and I, I pray that this doesn't come across as me patting myself on the back because I am so grateful that God has let me turn my glory into my work. Remember Moses 139, my work and my glory is to bring to pass immortality, eternal life, that for God they're synonymous, that what he does is what he loves to do anyway. And that's the life I've been able to lead. And I'm so grateful to God for the privilege of teaching the gospel. I just am struck by this statement from Gehazi and from Elisha and the exchange between them to put into perspective really what matters most. And I'm not saying quit your job and I'm not saying don't take your, your salary, but I am saying keep in proper perspective what matters most in life. And that's to be able to live the first and second great commandments and to bless God and to bless those around you. And there are so many incredible ways that we can do that professionally and personally and through callings and through service and through sacrifice and through tithing and fast offerings and humanitarian aid and, and so many other things. I just want to echo Elisha and caution the Gehazi inside of every one of us. I think we all battle with part Elisha and part Gehazi. And is it for me or is it for others? And as we continue to pray to God to purify our motives and to seek first the kingdom of God and then let anything else come or not come as the Lord chooses. This story, this chapter, and this first half of, of our lesson then ends in verse 27 with, 
the curse that falls upon Gehazi for his greed. The leprosy therefore of Naaman shall cleave unto thee and unto thy seed forever. And he went out from his presence a leper as white as snow. Oh, talk about poetic justice. Rather than receive Naaman's money, you will receive Naaman's affliction. I needed to teach Naaman that the things of God are not to be bought. And I needed to teach you that the things of God are not to be sold. And so what he was wrestling with and suffering from now becomes yours. Because all of these things, the gifts of God were not ours to begin with. Naaman learns it, now you learn it. And the question is, will you and I learn it too? I pray that we don't have to suffer as Naaman or now Gehazi suffered to realize what ought to matter most for us. Uh, it's our, our trials, our afflictions that turn us to God. And Gehazi was trying to put himself into a position where he wouldn't need so much help from God. He could trust in, his, in the arm of flesh because he was adding a little flesh to his arm. No, Gehazi, let me strip that of you. In fact, let me put you, let me start the whole process over again and put you back into the place where Naaman began his journey. That doesn't mean you have to end there. And this is not the last that we'll see of Gehazi. But to see that if we can at least begin in a place of reliance on the Lord, then hopefully we will end in a place where the Lord knows he can rely upon us. Elisha was one of those people that could be fully relied upon. And he's trying to teach us to do likewise.